Class Consciousness and Revolutionary Organization. This is from the ICT website, and it is the second part of the pamphlet, so chapter 6 to 10. Chapter 6, Spontaneity and Organization in the Russian Revolution of February 1917. We have arrived at the point where all previous ideas about what was and what was not revolutionary class consciousness reach their greatest test. Here we should perhaps begin with a warning on methodology. We don't look at the experience of the Russian Revolution as something to be learned by rote so we can mechanically repeat it in the future. The history of all previous class struggles tells us that no two events ever follow the same trajectory for the very obvious reason that they take place in different historical circumstances. Equally, the contending classes have before them the experience of that previous struggle and alter their actions accordingly. In this respect, we can be certain of only one thing. The next proletarian revolution will be very different in its origins and development from the Russian Revolution a century or so ago. This does not mean there is nothing to understand from that experience in terms of the development of class consciousness and class political organization. Just as the Russian working class of 1917 had before it the experiences of the Paris Commune of 1871 and the first Russian Revolution of 1905, we have the experience of 1917 as part of our historic legacy. The key issue is to understand what that legacy actually means for us today. The big questions revolve around how the working class moved from accepting the existing order to a full-scale overthrow of the political system, as well as three governments in the course of 10 months. What role did the previously politically aware workers play in the course of that development of a mass class, class consciousness? How did the working class establish class-wide organizations which were at total odds with the old ruling class state? But first we will deal with the question of the bourgeoisie's denial that there was any development of a revolutionary class consciousness at all. A bourgeois tragedy. After the collapse of the USSR in 1991, you would expect that the bourgeois ideological offensive against the revolution of 1917 would have eased up. Not a bit. In fact, the reverse was the case. No sooner was the military threat of the Soviet Union consigned to the dustbin of history than a whole new series of revisionist histories by bourgeois writers of all backgrounds we're trying to deny any working class character to the events of 1917. All were intent on denying the real proletarian character of the October Revolution. Doyen of them all was the ex-KGB general Dmitry Volkogonov, now deceased, who published two works which claimed to have racy new relations about how the Russia of Lenin consciously paved the way for the Russia of Stalin. However, a reading of the text shows that all this is publisher's froth. The archives have revealed little to, to alter what we know, at least so far. All Volkanov, Volkogonov did was to give an interpretation that would sell books to Western readers. No point writing for Russian readership since Apart from the new emerging revolutionary minorities, the whole issue is a yawn for them today. Volkogonov and his ilk have had an enormous influence on recent academic writing on the Russian Revolution in the West. You can see this by comparing the works of Neil Harding and Robert Service, both before and after the fall of the Soviet Union. Both have written extensively, two volumes in Harding's case and three in Service's case, about Lenin's role in the revolution. These are serious works widely researched and meticulously evidenced. However, in the 1990s, both have written smaller books to make sure that we know that they totally disapprove of Lenin. But not content, not content with denying that the October Revol Revolution was anything other than a coup, our bourgeois historians have now expanded into denigrating the very appearance, appearance of Soviets in the February Revolution. 
This is the aim of Orlando Fitch, who, in attempting to imitate the gossipy style of Simon Scamma in his book on the French Revolution, only gives us a good insight into what bourgeois consciousness is. What links the two books is the anti-Marxism. The French Revolution was good because it made us all citizens, the title of Scamma's work, but the Russian Revolution was a people's tragedy because it wanted to make us all comrades. For these public schoolboy scribblers, there can be no higher human progress beyond the current capitalist society. For them, freedom means continuing to enjoy the comfortable life of the Cambridge College, preserving its exclusiveness from the untutored masses. So bourgeois revisionism has only heaped more on its own mountain of distortions since 1990. The fact is that the bourgeois version of the Russian Revolution insists that there was no revolutionary or class consciousness amongst the Russian working class, but that the weaknesses of both the Russian liberal bourgeoisie and the existing power structures in Russia, which had not established a solid Westminster-style parliament, had allowed any old band of ruthless adventurers like the Bolsheviks to turn up and pick up the power which lay abandoned in the streets. This is a very ruling class conception. If our masters don't control power, then it must be an orphan. Or, as Trotsky put it, those who lose by revolution are rarely inclined to call by its real name, or call it by its real name. The fact that the spontaneous uprising of the Russian working class in February 1917 had very sound material reasons seems only peripheral, peripheral to their analysis. February 1917, Beyond Spontaneity. Here we use the term spontaneous carefully. The Tsarina Alexandra wrote to her husband that this was a hooligan movement, which would die down if only the Duma would behave itself. But the movement was anything but hooligan. Even if no organization planned the revolution, it had clear goals, which developed from demands for bread into a call for the overthrow of the monarchy and an end to the war. Spontaneous in this sense does not mean disorganized, but means that it has no single organizational center. Lenin was quite happy in his famous January 1917 lecture to Swiss socialist youth to state that the 1905 revolution was spontaneous, but as Trotsky noted in his wide-ranging analysis, the history of the Ruff Russian the history of the Russian Revolution, the mystic doctrine of spontane spontaneousness explains nothing. In order correctly to appraise the situation and determine the moment for a blow at the enemy, it was necessary that the masses or their guiding layers should make their examination of historical events and have their criteria for estimating them. In other words, it was necessary that there should be there should not be masses in the abstract, but masses of Petrograd workers and Russian workers in general, who had passed through the revolution of 1905. What Trotsky correctly emphasizes in that the dress rehearsal of 1905 is absolutely central to the formation of working class consciousness in February 1917. It explains why the actions of the masses in 1917 were so collectively coherent and, as Lenin noted, went well beyond the hesitant attitudes of the political parties. In a general sense, the revolution is only spontaneous in that the history of a revolution is, first of all, a history of the forcible entrance of the masses into the realm of rulership over their own destiny. This revolution, however, starts off from relatively limited perspectives. It only moves forward because a new situation has arisen. Society does not change its institutions as needs arises, the way a mechanic changes his instruments. On the contrary, society actually takes the institutions which hang upon it as a given, once and for all. For decades, the oppositional criticism is nothing more than a safety valve for mass, for mass dissatisfaction, a condition of the stability of the social structure. Such, in principle, for example, was the significance acquired by the social democratic criticism 
entirely exceptional conditions independent of the will of persons or parties are necessary in order to tear off from discontent the letters of cons conservatism and bring the masses to insurrection. In other words, changing circumstances create changed human beings. Here, Trotsky is demonstrating his grasp of Marxism. It echoes in a real historical context what Marx wrote in the German ideology, that the alteration of human beings on a mass scale can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. The entirely exceptional conditions he speaks of link the Bolshevik party and the revolutionary working class in 1917. In the long term, the Bolsheviks had held the view after 1906 that whatever the nature of the coming revolution, the working class would have to fight for a revolutionary democratic dictatorship of the proletariat and peasantry from the start. They were not hamstrung by the mechanistic theory of the Mensheviks that the proletariat would have to lend its support to the bourgeoisie to establish a democracy. This meant that the actions of individual Bolsheviks inside the class were always towards pushing forward the struggle of the working class as an independent class. Mensheviks, on the other hand, tended to look to, other, to their leaders to see what com compromises they were making with the democratic parties. This comes over in the personal record of Sukhanov. Although an internationalist Menshevik, i.e. a supporter of Martov on the left of the party, he records that he found the Bolsheviks in St. Petersburg in the February Revolution rather dreary and narrow. He arrives at this verdict because they were not willing to go to Gorky's house to coordinate with the other intellectual social democrats and progressive bourgeois politicians. Sukhanov complains that they did not understand the bigger picture. All they did was look around for printing presses to get out propaganda to the workers. This is significant because it tells us how the Bolsheviks were already embryonically the party of the class. Although <clears throat> they were not yet that party, they had also laid down the ground for work in the shorter term. The key issue here was the war. No other party in the world had come out so clearly against the war as the Bolsheviks. It is their greatest claim to revolutionary leadership in their entire history. Trotsky, who was not then a Bolshevik, points out that on the eve of the First World War, Bolshevik influence amongst the working class was at its height. Indeed, strike figures for 1913 to 14 show that Tsarism was facing a wave of strikes like that which preceded the 1905 revolution. The Bolsheviks had been growing in influence. Once war was declared, the St. Petersburg Committee of the Party issued a leaflet against it. It read, Comrades, the government and bourgeoisie have shown the wind. They will reap the whirlwind. Nicholas the Bloody will be the last Russian Tsar. Revolution is coming. Let's do all we can to make it victorious. This brought to the factories of St. Petersburg the message that Lenin was already fighting for on the international stage of turning the imperialist war into a civil war. Of course, this was not a way to instant popul popularity, but it did lay down a class position, a banner which would later become a rallying point for the working class. Once war was declared, a wave of patriotic fervor had engulfed Russia, like all the other belligerent states. The Bolsheviks, Sorry, the Bolsheviks declined numerically as the more conservative elements in the working class began to dominate, not least because the war gave the excuse for mass arrests of worker activists. However, this was a situation which only lasted until the end of 1915. As the Russian war effort ground to a halt and the economic impact of the war led to appalling shortages the discontent of the masses rose and the Bolsheviks persecuted their most experienced leaders in exile in Siberia or abroad and short of resources, were still able to exert a political influence beyond their real organizational strength. This was because they had taken a coherent programmatic stand against the war. 
Thus, when Trotsky answers his own question, who led the February Revolution, his lapidary statement, conscious and tempered workers educated for the most part by the party of Lenin, doesn't appear quite so metaphysical. He cites various examples of unsung Bolshevik memory or members, like the soldiers Morlov or the worker Karov, who carry out decisive actions at the level of the street in the early days of the February Revolution. Nor do we need to take only Trotsky's word. Orlando Fig, no friend of the proletariat, even concedes that socialist agitation amongst the working class was significant in the early hours of the February Revolution and getting striking workers out onto the street. This had begun on International Women's Day, February 23rd, according to the old calendar, when the annual demonstration was transformed by, by women strikers marching, marching from the working class Vibor Quarter to the Bourgeois Nevsky Prospect to add their protest against the bread shortages. On this day, the bread ration had been cut for the third time, so the shouts for Kleba, bread, were accompanied with the first cries of Doloi Tartskoi Monarchy, down with Tsarism. Working class agitation continued on February 24, 1917, when hundreds of thousands joined the, strike, the strikes. Workers held factory meetings throughout the city and urged on by socialist agitators resolved to march against the center. Many aimed themselves with knives, or many armed themselves with knives, spanner hammers. This is also significant because for all the street fighting and fraternization with troops that was to take place over the next five days, what gave it substance was the collective consciousness which had brought at least half, one police report gave 90%, of the St. Petersburg working class on strike. It gave life to what Lenin had written after the Moscow uprising of December 1905, that unless the revolution assumes a mass character and affects the troops, there can be no question of a serious struggle. Once on strike, they met every day at the factory and in these mass assemblies, decided to go down to the city center to demonstrate. No wonder the Tsar's state council ordered the factories to be locked to deny the workers this collective meeting place. It was also noted by eyewitnesses of all shades of opinion that, whereas the early demonstrations had been good humored and accompanied by people dressed respectably, this gradually changed on the afternoon of the 23rd as the mass movement became more proletarian in character. However, even now, when some Bolsheviks tried to unfurl a banner inscribed with the words Deloy Voigny, down with the war, they were set upon and the banner disappeared. Two days later, the crowds faced by armed troops were chanting the very same slogan in Znamenskaya Square. It wasn't just desperation then that had transformed the consciousness of the working class, but also a sense that the war had created a new situation different from 1905. In 1905, the army was still largely the professional army of the Tsar. The sense of futility of the war had not been so deep in 1905 either. Now, and various eyewitnesses testify to this, as the demonstrators realized that the largely peasant conscript reservists, which made up the bulk of the Petrograd garrison, were unlikely to shoot, they grew more confident. The final key to it was the Cossacks, who had never hesitated in the past to gun down any anti-Tsarist demonstrators. But the workers were already attempting to fraternize with them on the very first day of the uprising. Emboldened individuals, often women but also men, would go up to soldiers, seize the barrel of their gun, and beg them to turn it the other way. There is no record of any of these appeals failing. Once the Cossacks made it clear that they were only standing in line and not really attacking the demonstrators, the regime's last bastion was the police. Although some soldiers in some regiments had shot down strikers early in the revolution, it was the fighting between the police and the other soldiers that led to most of the casualties. Once the Cossacks, at the request of the Bolshevik worker Kachirov, 
killed Constable Krilov, a top police officer in the act of ordering his forces to shoot on a crowd in Znam Znamenskaya Square, the last hesitation of the mass movement ended. The revolution was in full swing. Although some regiments were still slow to come over to the workers, and there were exchanges of gunfire within and between regiments, the numbers on the streets increased. Red flags began to appear everywhere. What for years had been mere ideas put forward by revolutionary minorities were now taking on a practical dimension. Nowhere was this clearer than the question of what was to, what was to replace Tsarism. The bourgeoisie had watched with horror as the working class and the peasant army reservists had wiped away centuries of autocracy, whilst they themselves had done nothing. However, the more energetic amongst them, especially those in labor organizations like Kerensky, realized some response was needed if the underclass were to be prevented from taking over. This is the key point in any revolution. Workers can do the fighting and the dying on the streets, but unless they know what they want, they are likely to be stitched up by one or the other capitalist faction. This was clearly illustrated in more recent times in Poland, when the shipyard workers of Gdansk started the movement to overthrow the Stalinist apparatus in Poland. Lacking an independent class perspective of their own, since they were workers overthrowing a supposed worker state, they succumbed to the leadership of reactionary Catholicism in the shape of Lech Walesa's Solidarity Movement, itself maintained by CIA finance. This illustrates the limits of a movement which can, with practical steps, demolish a hated regime, but which, without its own programmatic perspective, cannot create a new society. This programmatic perspective has to be posed in advance within the working class by those workers who understand that a change of leadership is not enough to make a revolution. In Russia, the social democratic movement had been doing this, making this vital contribution to the February Revolution. But once the Tsar had gone, the acid test would be in the nature of what followed. It was a testimony to the strength of the class movement in Petrograd that the bourgeoisie did not get things all their own way. When Kerensky and his pals in the Socialist Revolutionary Party were prepared to sit with conservative Duma members like Shingarev and Milyukov it, to create a prov provisional government, the workers and soldiers who had done the fighting had or also demanded their own organizations. As Trotsky said, this was not just any old proletariat. This was the same Russian proletariat who had recently experienced the 1905 revolution. In some respects, they did not need to wait for their political minorities to remind them of 1905 as it was still relatively fresh in their collective consciousness. That is why when the Bolsheviks put out a leaflet on February 27th calling for elections to the Soviets, they were already echoing calls by cooperative organizations and newly formed factory organizations for Soviet power. Soviets without communism. The actual decision to revive the 1905 Soviet seems to have arisen when the crowds on the Vyborg side the working class district around the Finland station decided to free the prisoners in the Kresti Crosses prison. Amongst these was the Menshevik first president of the 1905 Soviet, Krustalev Nosar. The Mensheviks led the way in forming the new Soviet and linked it with the Tsarist War Industries Committees, which were led by Gav Gavozdev another Menshevik. As they were designed to improve war production, the Bolsheviks had led a successful boycott campaign against them. At this point, many histories make the point that the Bolsheviks had seemingly played little overt part in the revolution. There were several, several reasons for this. Like all other parties, they had not expected the revolution and were even cautioning women strikers not to get isolated on February 24th. The first Bolshevik leaflet calling for a general strike only hit the streets on the 26th or the 26th 
by which time hundreds of thousands were already out. The Bolshevik leadership in St. Petersburg was undoubtedly weak. The St. Petersburg Committee was so decimated by arrests that the Vyborg Committee was given its role. However, the Bolsheviks were not idle. As we have seen, individual Bolsheviks were with the workers on the streets and often took the initiative in, in giving an informal lead when it was required. The Bolsheviks did not go to the to the Torrid Palace to be present at the setting up of the provisional government. And the Soviet, because they regarded this as all in the realm of the bourgeoisie and were thus cut out by the re-establishment of the Petrograd Soviet. Fig scoffs at the revival of the Soviet, pointing out accurately enough that its original executive was made up of intellectuals who represented the political parties. Even the Bolsheviks were allocated two seats on it. What he does not explain, because it undermines his basic argument that this was an, Ill an illegitimate power, is that this was only the beginning of the process. Very soon, every regiment would be electing its own delegates. These delegates were not the articulate intellectuals who formed the provisional executive, but peoples whose voice had rarely ever been heard in history. Sukhanov gives a vivid picture of their artless entry onto the stage of history. We had a meeting. We have been told to say the officers hid to join the Soviet of the workers' deputies. They told us to say that we refuse to serve against the people anymore. We're going to join with our brother workers, all united to defend the people's cause. We would lay down our lives for that. Our general meeting told us to greet you. Long live the revolution. It was there and then proposed and approved with storms of applause to fuse together the revolutionary army and the proletariat of the capital and create a united organization to be called from then on the Soviet of workers and soldiers deputies. Many factories already had elected delegates to the Soviet. At the same time, unlike in 1905, the Soviet movement spread rapidly to the provinces. Within a fortnight, there were 77 other Soviets in cities and towns around Russia. There is much to comment on here. In the first place, the Soviet or Workers' Council represents the historically discovered form of the proletarian transformation of society. If proletarian revolution can only be carried out by the immense majority, it has to have a totally different form of organization to bourgeois society. In bourgeois society, parliamentarism represents the class form of the rule. It creates the illusion of mass rule of democracy, but in actual fact depends on the passivity of the citizens. They get to vote once every four or five years for representatives who then have the total freedom to do as they like with their so-called democratic mandate. The citizens cannot object and indeed any strike or other form of direct action to object to a policy comes up against the argument that the democratically elected representatives have the only legitimate authority. Note the difference with the Soviet. The soldiers delegates repeatedly state, we have been told to say, or our general meeting stated, these are delegates, they have a direct mandate. They don't vote how they like, but how they were told to vote by their workers or regimental assembly. If they don't, they can be instantly recalled and replaced. Bourgeois theorists constantly tell us that, the sort of direct that this sort of direct democracy is impractical, but the whole experience of 1917 demonstrates the opposite. This democracy is not subject to bribery of individuals and controlled only by the electors. But then that's why the bourgeoisie hate it and why they get their hack writers to denigrate it. Up until now, there has been nothing more effective in allowing the mass of the population to directly participate in government than the Soviet movement. What does this tell us about class consciousness and political organization? First, that in a practical movement like a revolution, the working class will recreate, even in slightly amended form, organs that they have already experimented with in the past. Second, that even the best proletarian party can be left behind by events. Lenin had no qualms about telling the world that the working class as a whole were infinitely more revolutionary than any political party, including the Bolsheviks. 
However, this is not the end of the story. The real issue is how does that party respond to the new situation? All the evidence is that the working class members of the Bolshevik party acquitted themselves when in the turmoil of February. Less impressive were the so-called leaders. If Sh Shlyapnikov and company vacillated in late February, they at least stuck to the revolutionary defeatist policy, which characterized the Bolsheviks throughout the war. But the, when they were replaced by old Bolsheviks like Stalin, Muranov, and Kamenev, newly re released from Siberian exile, the picture became blurred. The new threesome took over Pravda and began writing about the need to support the provisional government. Kamenev even wrote that the war must go on until the Germans had been pun pushed out of Russia. Lenin's irritation and anger about this is well known. Less well known is the perplexed reaction of the rank and file who had defended the revolutionary defeatist position throughout the war. Whilst Lenin's April theses were a bombshell to some of the Bolshevik leadership, they were welcomed as a restatement of Bolshevik clarity in the factories. All the indications are that this confusion was too short to be critical, but it also illustrates that the Bolshevik party was not the rigidly disciplined organization which Stalinist legend has made it out to be. What we have tried to show here is that its strengths were that it had a clear revolutionary political orientation and that in advance of the revolution, oh shit, and that it was a distinct part of working class life in advance of the revolution. These were to be critical factors in the development of a revolutionary party in 1917, and this forms the next focus of our study. It is one, one thing for the working class to create class-wide organs which actually carry out the transformation of society, but these organs cannot do this as long as they are dominated by political programs which call for class collaboration with the dominant class. Soviets with communists, from the beginning of May, the distinction between the Bolsheviks and the other political parties became sharper. This was critical to the future development of the revolution. It is one thing for the working class to overthrow a regime, even to establish class-wide organizations, but it is another to make these organs of revolutionary transformation. As we saw in the last part of this text, the Soviets in the German Revolution were always dominated by the Social Democrats, who simply got them to vote for the bourgeois option of a parliamentary regime. In Russia, history took a different course, largely as we argued in the previous issue, because there was preparation of the working class for the next indecisive step. The Bolshevik refusal to accept the compromise of dual power, the refusal to accept that the revolution was now over as a parliamentary regime, had been established, meant that they set out an alternative for the working class. As the material situation shifted, as the hopes for a democratic peace faded, the Bolsheviks were the only party who constantly called for all power to the Soviets. In 1917, the class struggle did not reach a peak in February. In February, it had barely started. Once the Tsar was out of the way, the bourgeois provisional government was face to face with workers and soldier Soviets. The only party which was not compromised by being represented in the provisional government as well as in the Soviets was the Bolsheviks. The Soviets under Menshevik and SR leadership straddled the two and these parties got the Soviet to agree to support the provis provisional government. In practice, the workers and soldiers were supporting decrees of the Soviet which undermined bourgeois rule such as the orders on military discipline where officers were no longer allowed to address soldiers as Thai, a disrespectful form of you, or more seriously, officers had to listen to elected committees. Dual power, power then was always an uneasy compromise. Real power always lay with the Soviet, but the Soviet did not use it. However, once it was clear that the cadet foreign minister and strongman of the bourgeois regime, Milyakov, wanted to follow the Tsar's policy of annexation of territory, the Soviet demanded his resignation. 
This was followed by the disastrous June Offensive, which confirmed that a war to victory was a distant chimera. This was the pivotal point at which the 1917 revolution turned. The Bolsheviks' continued principal opposition to the war was now to make its program, which had itself evolved during the course of the war and the crisis of 1917, into the only alternative for the Russian working class. The, rela the relationship between party and class in the, in the later part of 1917 is what we will turn to in the next chapter. Chapter 7. Party and Class in the Revolutionary Wave of 1917-21 to 21. The experience of the Russian Revolution is the single most important event in any discussion of the nature of working class consciousness. The emergence of a proletarian party and the nature of class decision making. In the last part, we showed how the Bolsheviks had emerged as a class party in 1917. In this part, we wish to begin confronting the issue which has hung around the neck of the revolutionary proletariat since the early 1920s. How is it that a revolution which began with such promise of liberation for the proletariat and therefore for the whole of, human, er, whole of humanity ended in the mire of one of the worst tyrannies in world history? This is significant because there has been a long tradition of rejecting the role of the party which has made many would-be revolutionaries, for example, in the current anti-capitalist movement, fear any form of organization. Given what we have already argued on this question earlier in this series, such a fear represents a real danger for the working class. If we cannot overcome it, our capacity to act together as a class will not just be severely impeded, but the prospect of revolution will vanish. The roots of this anti-organizational tendency lie in the reaction to the Russian, Russian Revolution, particularly in the writings of the so-called councilists, who are still influential amongst today's anti-capitalists. Councilism and Revolution Anton Panikok, the Dutch communist, once wrote that the working class only has two weapons, its organization and its consciousness. However, Panna Koch, founder, mem founder member of the German Communist Workers' Party, KAPD, and later prophet of Council Communism, gave different answers at different times as to the precise relationship between these two factors. As a member of the KAPD, he put the original emphasis on the fact that the proletarian party, as the organization of the most class-conscious workers, had to have a program which was hard as steel, clear as glass, in order to carry out its historic tasks. This was what Panikok at that time realized was the real legacy of the Bolshevik party in 1917. He correctly contrasted this with the opportunism and betrayal of the parties of the Third International, including the Bolsheviks, which by 1921 were retreating back to making alliances with the same social democrats who had betrayed the workers in supporting imperialist war in 1914 and then became organizations dedicated to the preservation of the capitalist system after the First World War. In Germany, this betrayal was clearer than anywhere else, since after 1919, a river of blood that included the cold-blooded murder of hundreds of communist workers, as well as Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht, separated the revolutionary proletariat from social democracy. This made it all the more detestable that the German Communist Party under Paul Levi not only expelled those who were to become the KAPD for their opposition to the tactical use of parliamentarism and trade unionism, but was also to go along with the Comintern's policy when faced with a declining revolutionary situation of forming united fronts with the Social Democrats who, in secret alliance with the Kaisers, former generals, were now the backbone of the new bourgeois Weimar Republic. For some of Panikok's comrades in the Berlin section of the KAPD, a renewed German form of Bolshevism was not the solution. Led by Otto Ruhl, who had the distinction of being the first so Social Democrat MP to vo vote against war credits after Karl Liebknecht, they now began to condemn the party from itself 
as being a bourgeois creation and thus alien to the process of proletarian emancipation. The Berlin tendency had some immediate experience to back up Rule's claim. Not only had Rule been initially forced to obey the Social Democratic Parliamentary Party discipline and vote for the Kaiser's War in August 1914, but he had also seen how the once impeccably revolutionary Bolshevik Party, the only significant party to fight against the war, had degenerated under the extremely arduous pressure of a so-called civil war, which was in fact an international war fought on Russian soil. The consequences of this civil war were materially dis disastrous for the Russian revolutionary proletariat. Not only were more than two million wiped out, but the mobilization of the most class-conscious workers into a new Red Army undermined the operation of the Soviet system. The Soviets were in decline by 1919, and even though Soviet Congresses were still convened by 1920, these were empty shells rather than the vibrant bodies they had once been. Rule, however, avoided any material analysis of this decline. For rule, the problem was that the Bolsheviks had followed, failed ideology to carry out the communist program. He was among the first to point out that what had been created in Russia was not a communist society, but a state capitalist one. This, however, does him no credit. Lenin himself said that the Soviet Republic was a mixed economy, and the state capitalist parts were for him amongst it its better achievements. However, no one was really talking at this point of a socialist society, since the young Soviet Republic was still living in the hand-to-mouth existence of the realm of necessity. If, if economically, the proletariat had inherited a situation in late 1917 akin to the economic collapse of the Black Death in the 14th century, the description is by Edward Acton, professor of history, at East Anglia University in him, um, in his book, Rethinking the Russian Revolution. Imagine the situation after three more years and eight million more deaths. Due to this war foisted on the proletariat by the intervention of international imperialism. Only a worldwide shift in the balance of class power could have posed the question of socialism. But rule, after years in the ranks of social democracy, saw revolution only in idealist terms. The hesitations of the Bolshevik Party and the Communist International were not, according to him, due to adverse historical circumstances, but to the inherent conservatis conservatism of all ex-social democratic parties. It was a short step from here to the conclusion that all parties are bourgeois, what matter was no longer the organization which encapsulated the consciousness of those who had always been communist, but only the class-wide bodies which gave voice to the whole class. This was the origin of the theory of councilism, which Rule has a strong claim to be the father. Councilism and Marxism But councilism is predicated on a rejection of the very principles of how class consciousness arises as laid out by Marx in the German ideology. If class consciousness uniformly arises inside the working class, then the question of party versus Soviet becomes fairly academic, and the party would be irrele irrelevant, but in fact this is not the case. Class consciousness exists in fragmented form amongst different groups of workers, according to relatively recent class experience. Such experiences may be fleeting, a strike in one industry. They may be spaced out over years so that workers only have dim recollections of what has happened previously, or they may be particularly violent outbursts of struggle which no one forgets, but which separates groups' experience differently. What draws these episodes together is not the direct experience of the actual struggle, the spontaneous councilist hypothesis but the reflections of those workers and activists who recognize that this or that struggle is only a part of a greater whole and is the product of the class antagonisms of capitalist society as a whole. Outside of the immediate struggle, how can these groups of workers develop their experience and the consciousness which has been aroused by that experience? 
a permanent political organization that takes the acquisitions of the past into the future struggles, is not simply desirable. Its appearance as part of the process of ever-widening class consciousness is inevitable. This is the organization that we call the party. Rule rejected this. Ultimately, he argued that only economic organizations of the class were necessary. Although he was opposed to all trades unions, his view was finally a sort of anarcho-syndicalist idea. Like other members of the German left who went on to become councillists, he never saw the contradiction in, in this view. For Rule, the very idea of party was a bourgeois construct. What he did not see was that the bourgeois party, with its machinery designed to win votes, was a totally different beast from the party of the proletariat. Whilst the former was solely an instrument for representing economic interests within the system the proletarian party only became, only came into existence as the bearer of the historic program for the emancipation of the class. This means that not only was it a different type of body altogether, it also had a fundamentally different relationship to the majority of its class. The bourgeois party demanded that voters vote for it in order to leave it to rule, but the proletarian party is a guide, a leadership to direct mass proletarian action towards the overthrow of the old order. Whilst the party has an important guiding role in the actual process of insurrection and will have to lead in that insurrection, in the last resort, it has to be this mass of the class, not the party, which finally overthrows the old order by drawing an even greater mass into the process which begins to build a new one. The precise relationship between class party and mass of the class cannot be decided in advance, since it is only in the process of revolution that the working class shakes off the muck of ages. But historical logic cannot be turned on its head. First, class consciousness takes a minority form, and then this minority points the way forward to the whole class, in a revolutionary situation. Only once the capitalist order has been overthrown does the working class set up the required new material conditions for the development of a mass communist class consciousness. The Russian Experience of October 1917. This introduction on the theoretical roots of councilism takes us back to where we had finished chapter six in Russia in the middle of 1917. The Bolsheviks themselves were not a de ex machina. They were part of the revolutionary movement of the Russian working class. As a party, the Bolshevik party did not start and finish 1917 as the same organization. In the course of that momentous year, although it had the right raw material, Bolshevism was forged into a tool of the revolutionary proletariat. As we make clear in the last part of this series, this was neither a mystical process, nor was the outcome preordained. First of all, the Bolsheviks in 1914 remained true to a proletarian program when the vast majority of the social democratic parties abandoned all that they claimed to stand for. In second place, the Bolsheviks were a grassroots organization which, despite the arrest and exile of their leaders, worked in the factories and in the garrisons to take their anti-war message into the daily class struggle. The very fact that successive leaderships of the party were arrested or exiled meant that worker activists displayed a lot more initiative wherever they found themselves. Local activists did not have to wait for the leaders to tell them what to do. In some places like Tsar... Tsar... Fuck. Tsaritsyn? later Stalingrad, today of Volgograd, the October Revolution actually started before that in Petrograd. By the middle of 1917, the Bolsheviks were, in a certain sense, almost too successful. Once Lenin had convinced the party leaders in May to accept that the rank and file had known all along, i.e. that the provisional government had to be overthrown and an attempt to create socialism started, then the proletariat had a clear banner around which to rally. As the war effort of the provisional government ground to a halt in June, the steadfast anti-war position of Bolshevism became the only hope for a working class facing starvation and a further mobilization for yet one more suicidal offensive. The July Days 
Here, though, a further test of a proletarian party was to take place. Inevitably, given what we have already understood about the uneven development of class consciousness, some workers more impatient to make the revolution than others, and this was the case of the sailors based in Kronstadt, the naval fortress near Petrograd. In July 1917, they decided to follow up the June demonstration which had been called by those Soviet parties who supported the provisional government to show the Bolsheviks that they were an absolute minority. In the event, it turned into a pro-Bolshevik demonstration against the provisional government with banners calling for immediate peace and the overthrow of the provisional government. The sailors decided that an armed demonstration in favor, favor of Soviet power would now topple the provisional government. However, the rest of the class was not yet ready. The consequences of the failure of the June offensive had not yet sunk in to a wider layer of the class. This, the Bolsheviks, present, present in the factories, understood, so the sailors' action left them in a terrible dilemma. Here, demonstrating below the balcony of the Kosciuszynskaya Palace, where the Bolsheviks had their headquarters, were thousands of armed sailors demanding that the Bol Bolsheviks put themselves at the head of the demonstration, which, after all, only repeated the Bolshevik slogans of June, and march across the Lit Litany Bridge straight towards the center of the city. Lenin, Lenin was horrified and even said to Podvoisky, the leader of the Bolshevik military organization, which was supposed to argue for their line within the barracks, that he ought to be thrashed for not having warned the sailors earlier that what they were trying was premature. When called upon to greet the demonstrators, Lenin basically told them to enjoy the demonstration, but to peacefully return home as the provisional government might use it as a provocation to attack them. The sailors were mystified at this address. They did not see that, though they represented Bolshevik thinking, the rest of the class would need more time to get to where they were. The decision of the Bolsheviks in the July days, not, not to support the sailors nor to criticize them, undermines once and for all the bourgeois idea that they were simply a gang of putschists. The Bolshevik leadership as a whole knew that no action was possible without wider class support. On the contrary, it was the Kronstadters, many of them anarchists, who were the putschists since they thought that all that was needed was for them to give a lead and the rest of the class would follow. As the best elements of the revolutionary proletariat were already moving into the Bolshevik party, the Bolsheviks themselves knew that the tide of class opinion was still flowing in their direction, but had not yet reached uh, sufficient strength for showdown with the provisional government. The Bolsheviks thus managed to tone down the demonstration a little without, a, without ever openly abandoning it, it to its fate. The Bolsheviks remained with the class. For this reason, the Bolsheviks were proscribed, their press smashed up, their leaders imprisoned or forced to flee, like Lenin and subjected to a massive lie campaign that they acted for Germany. But despite the provisional government's assault on the Bolsheviks, the working class hardly wavered in its support, and the Bolshevik party, after an initial fortnight of decline, reemerged from the crisis stronger than ever. October, coup d'etat, or revolution. The Bolshevik revival was due to their depth of support in the class, but the speed of the recovery was largely due to the infighting between the various strands of the bourgeoisie. When Kornilov, the man Kerensky had named as his new army commander, decided to lead an assault on Petrograd, it was the Bolsheviks, because they were so deeply rooted in the working class, who were the only force to organize resistance. The persuasion of Belt the persuasion of Bolshevik activists undermined the purpose of Kornilov's troops. Even the savage division, the former elite support for Tsarism, and the, and the revolt simply faded away. The activity of the Bolsheviks made them the most significant factor in the consciousness of the urban working class in Russia, and it was no surprise 
that they won 80% of the delegate pl uh, places in elections to the two main Soviets, Petrograd and Moscow. This was on the basis of the unambiguous slogans of all power to the Soviets and down with the provisional government. This was now the very concrete advance in consciousness that Lenin, still in exile, was waiting for. It indicated that the anti-capitalist, anti-provisional government sentiment of the workers was, was now so developed that the overthrow of the provisional government could now be undertaken. The actual planning of the insurrection was formally given to the Military Revolutionary Committee, headed by Trotsky, of the Petrograd Soviet, which was virtually a Bolshevik body since they dominated it and the Mensheviks and SRs, except the left SRs who were about to split from their bourgeois colleagues, did not attend it. However, in the end, it was not any detailed plan in advance which guaranteed victory. It was the general class consciousness inside the working class that the provisional government was their class enemy. When Kerensky decided to forestall any more armed demonstrations coming from the workers' districts to the north of the city by closing the bridges over the Neva, his troops were stopped and arrested by the workers' militias, who spotted that the bridges were about to be raised. This was the signal for the Military Revolutionary Committee to act, and the city was taken over. Despite Einstein's propaganda, or Eisen, sorry, Eisenstein's propaganda film, October, this was done without bloodshed. Kerensky simply could not find loyal troops to defend a regime which had long before lost the confidence of the masses. Indeed, it is important to state that it was only when the proletariat removed from the Soviet executive the parties which had been shielding the provisional government, the Mensheviks and the SRs, that the total bankruptcy of the Kerensky regime was revealed. The October Revolution was neither the simple coup d'etat of bourgeois propaganda, nor the great military triumph that the Soviet regime later portrayed, but the culmination of months of growing class awareness of the alternatives posed in 1917. For Lenin, the month of October had been very frustrating. The overwhelming support of the working class for Bolshevik delegates only underscored that the overthrow of the provisional government was on the agenda, and he had, been, he had been bombarding the Bolshevik leadership in Petrograd with the request that they seize state power. The rest of the Bolshevik leadership prevaricated, and it was only Kerensky's actions which galvanized them into action. They would have been lost if they had not been working in a situation in which the mass of the class was with them. This is the key to the issue. This chapter is not about the events of 1917, but we have had to look at 1917 in detail because this is the only raw experience we have of the relationship of party, class, and consciousness in a real revolution. 1917 gives us the only direct evidence of how the proletariat can come to power. Our councilists, with whom we started this part of the article, often accept the bourgeois argument that October was a coup d'etat. Or if they don't, they have an illogical and unrealistic formula which says that the October Revolution was proletarian, but the Bolsheviks who led it were bourgeois. What we have briefly tried to show here is that the distinction between party and class will blur in a situation where the party, by all measurable criteria, has the overwhelming support of the mass of the class. In the few months before October, even many anarchists recognized that Bolshevism had gone beyond the old statist, reformist, social democracy, and they joined the party. Lenin himself, whilst in exile in Finland, recognized at this time in State and Revolution that the anarchists were justified in saying about such social democrats that they were failing in their task of giving the workers a revolutionary education. This confluence of anarchism and Bolshevism in the Russian Revolution obviously should not be exaggerated, but it is further evidence to show that the experience of 1917 was transforming the political landscape and forging a revolutionary instrument in the Bolshevik party. Councilists also cannot fault the Bolsheviks as the quintessential Soviet party. No other party stood so consistently for Soviet power. Indeed, one of, one of the reasons why the revolution degenerated so quickly is that the other parties represented in the Soviet did not maintain the same principles. 
On some occasions between 1918 and 1920, the Mensheviks, for example, were divided into three fractions, or three factions. One, usually around Martov, was in the Soviets. Another was neutral, whilst a third negotiated with the whites to get rid of Soviet power. It was the same with the left SRs, who were not only in the Soviet, but part of the Council of People's Commissars, i.e. the Soviet government, until peace was signed with Germany. They then not only abandoned their government positions, but also the, so the Soviet and returned to terrorism by assassinating the German ambassador and several Bolsheviks. But that is not the only evidence that the Bolsheviks were the only party committed to workers to workers' councils. Under the Bolsheviks, many more Soviets were set up across Russia, and in the first few months of the revolution, Bolshevik leaders toured factories urging workers to recognize that the new system was based on participation, not passivity. Even the great debate between councilists and left communists that the factory committees were deliberately undermined by the Bolsheviks ignores the fact that it was the factory committees themselves that called for greater centralization in order to function less chaotically. In some ways, the factory committee's issue is a bit of a sideshow, as the real issue is the decline of Soviet power and the growth of the role of the party in every avenue of life. This underlines the most important lesson of the Russian Revolution. Whilst the party may represent the vanguard of the class, it cannot take on the role of the mass of the class in transforming society. The party is not a government, but a political guide in the circumstances of 1918 to 21. This was not understood. It was assumed that, until the World Revolution, the party could act as a sort of regent for the proletariat until it revived its conscious activity. But the history of proletarian class consciousness shows that this artificial way of looking at consciousness cannot work. Once the class in any generation begins to lose his conscious will to create a new society, no artificial expedient can revive it. Lenin knew this. It was the main reason why Lenin insisted that the provisional government had to be overthrown in October, whilst the proletariat were prepared for it. However, Lenin was making his arguments with the perspective that class consciousness was international and that whatever the weakness of the situation in Russia, the world revolution would help to transform the material situation. As we now know, history did not work out that way. The Russian revolution was isolated and the question of how an isolated proletarian bastion could survive was put on the agenda for the only time in our history. It is to the issue of how the Russian revolution declined and its significance for us that we turn in the next chapter. Chapter 8 The Decline of the Russian Revolution and the Cult of the Party Despite taking place a century ago, the Russian Revolution remains the single most important event for, sh for shaping our understanding of the question of class consciousness in this epoch. As the only time in history when a self-consciously working class movement actually arrived at the head of state power, it hands down to us a rich heritage of experience which we cannot ignore. In fact, so important is this event for our epoch that we have to return to it yet again. In the last part, we tackle the ideas of councilism, which sprang up as the revolutionary period which followed the First World War came to a shuddering defeat. We consider that councilism is itself a distorted product of that counter-revolution because it actually theorizes the idea that spontaneity alone will be enough to spark the revolutionary movement, which will transform society. In doing so, it actually does violence to the way in which class consciousness amongst a propertyless working class arises. Councilism blamed, blamed the Bolshevik party as the agent of proletarian defeat, and councilists have gone on to argue that this was because the Bolsheviks were either insufficiently clear politically and programmatically, or were even, in some versions, always counter-revolutionary in their ideas. This is both historically inaccurate and methodologically untenable. The Bolsheviks, for good or ill, 
were the best elements in political terms that existed within the old Second International. Their position on the war alone made them the vanguard of not just the Russian proletariat, but the international proletariat as well. We should also remember that, as we show in our pamphlet 1917, Bolshevism wasn't just a movement which sprang from the head of one man. It was a political representation of the revolutionary working class, and which was forged as, as a revolutionary party in the struggles of 1917 by responding to the actual class movement. As a result of that experience, revolutionaries from many countries looked to them to lead the world revolution. However, this was a task which was actually beyond Bolshevism, or anyone else for that matter. The Russian proletariat was a minority in a backward capitalist country. As all the Bolsh Bolshevik leaders repeatedly stated in 1917 to 18, without a German revolution, we are doomed. Or as Rosa Luxemburg put it, the question of socialism could only be posed in Russia. It would have to be answered further west. As that answer never came, the question became one of survival rather than revolutionary transformation. As we have said many times in the past, there was nothing in Marxist theory which, which prepared an isolated proletarian bastion to deal with this question. Bolshevik errors and the rise of the party dictatorship. Bolshevism was an instrument of the revolution forged in the class struggle, but a revolutionary party is a fighting party. It is not an instrument of government. Fighting for the communist program in the Soviets is one thing, but becoming the government and the state is another. Whilst we can agree with the councilists that, despite its revolutionary origins, the Bolshevik party was also the agent of the counter-revolution when the class movement was defeated, we have to differentiate ourselves from them in that we see this as a result of an objective process of defeat and not due to the predetermined weaknesses of the Bolshevik party. As we have shown in the series, the Bolsheviks were the least hidebound, the most open to change of all the parties of the Second International. This makes it all the more important for us to learn from the way in which the Russian Revolution collapsed into a bureaucratic counter-revolution which ultimately spawned Stalinism. The first lesson is that no amount of revolutionary exhortation can turn around a material process. In the winter of 1917 to 18, even hostile observers concede that the Bolsheviks went around trying to get more workers to run their own system. In this period, real grassroots Soviet power expanded Lenin's own exhortations in the factories were all along the lines of what he said at the Third Congress of Soviets in January 1918. Socialism cannot be implemented by a minority, by the party. It can be implemented only by tens of millions when they have learned to do it for themselves. However, harsh reality was soon to undermine this early aspiration. In the first place, during the course of the revolution of 1917, the Bolshevik party had welded itself into a disciplined whole to lead the assault on bourgeois power. It was the largest and most all-Russian organization in Russia by October 1917. However, proletarian revolutionary parties are not governmental parties. Whilst they lead the revolutionary assault, they do not form the government as such even if party members take important roles in the post-revolutionary society. As Lenin said repeatedly in the winter of 1917 to 18, the proletariat as a whole have to build socialism. Bolshevik practice, however soon, however, soon began to undermine this. To start with the Bolsheviks set up a cabinet of the Council of People's Commissars to run the departments of state calling the leaders of these departments People's Commissars, Trotsky's brainwave, did not hide the fact that they were ministers in the old sense. Instead of relying on the class-wide bodies of the Soviets to elect an executive which ran the government, the Bolsheviks had already begun the process of supplanting Soviet rule. This was not a conscious process, but followed a recurrent pattern in every area of life in the RSFSR. 
In the early days, Sovnarkom, Sovnarkom always made sure that the Soviet executive got the chance to discuss and reject Sovnarkom plans. Put, but in practice, this happened less and less often as the revolution was faced with international invasion. The Soviets met less and less often, and the Congress of Soviets, which began as quarterly affairs, had ceased to be such by 1920. In some ways, even if the form of Soviet rule had been more firmly adhered to, it would have made little difference. <clears throat> the need to send the most class-conscious workers to fight in the Red Army in the period 1918-20 to 20 tore the heart out of properly functioning Soviets. The party was quite rapidly transformed into the real governmental organization in Russia. Again, this was not planned in advance nor was it an immediate reality. The victory of October had led to an outburst of unfettered discussion and controversy unprecedented in the annals of the Bolshevik party and perhaps rare in those of any other. However, the process of concentration of power within the party had already begun and with it came the domination of the party over the organs of the state. The same men sharing the same traditions and the same purpose directed the affairs of party and state. The same incessant crisis and the same uninterrupted pressure of events weighed equally between 1917 and 1921 on party and Soviet institutions. The outstanding developments of these years in the machinery of the state, the concentration of central authority in the hands of Sovnarkom, at the expense of the All-Russian Congress of Soviets and of VTSIK and the concentration of authority at the center at the expense of the local Soviets and Congresses of Soviets and their organs had actually preceded the corresponding developments in the party organization. For some time, the lines of development in party and state ran parallel. Then, by, by and in an an inevitable process that began to converge and finally to coincide. This process had been virtually completed by the time of Lenin's death. This is the schematic overview and takes in the whole period 1917 to 24. However, the pattern is the same in every area. Even on the issue of the factory committees whose suppression, the councilists, makes so much of, the truth is rather more complicated. It was clear to all that the factory committees were at best patchy in their performance. Workers on the railways who took to housing themselves in rolling stock rather than using it for running the railways for society is perhaps one of the more extreme examples. But the factory committees were also dominated by Bolshevik workers who demanded greater coordination and centralization. It was they, supported by the left communists who were the main opposition group inside the party, who insisted on the setting up of the Supreme Economic Council of Visenka. Even a liberal critic of the revolution could write that the Council of People's Commissars took a step in the direction of the leftist plan, apparently at the behest of the factory committee leadership with the creation of the Supreme Economic Council and the authorization for similar local councils in December 1917. The council was initially dominated by leftists the first chairman was Osinsky, and the governing bureau included Bukharin, Lamov, and Vladimir Smirnov. Despite the dubious success of the central and local councils in the ensuing months, they represented enough doctrinal momentum to evoke from Lenin a final expression of his 1917 anarchism. He declared to the Congress of Local Economic Councils he held in May 1918 the apparatus of the old state is doomed to die, but the apparatus of the type of our Supreme Economic Council is destined to grow, develop, and become strong, fulfilling all the important functions of an organized society. This, though, was at the end of what the Bolshevik economist L. Kritzman called later the heroic period of the revolution. It was a period which ended when the Civil War broke out after the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, with Germany in March 1918. From now on, the constant drain on the already shattered Russian working class was to further undermine the Soviet principle. 
party and class. Again, we have to repeat that the degeneration of the revolution was not the result of any preconceived idea about the party. At the 8th Party Congress in March 1919, there was no babbling about the party being the same as the class. On the contrary, the relationship of party and class was seen quite clearly. The Communist Party sets as its goal the achievement of decisive influence and complete leadership in all organizations of the workers, in trades unions, in cooperatives, agricultural communes, etc. The Communist Party especially tries to carry out its program and its complete domination in the state organizations of the present time, the Soviets. The party attempts to guide the activities of the Soviets, but not to replace them. This last line sums it up. The class-wide organs represent the whole class, whilst the party represents only the vanguard. The most advanced workers alone cannot make the revolution, since the revolution means the total social and economic transformation of the whole mode of production. It cannot be done by the minority. Um, it is not that Soviets or any other class-wide body are just a nice idea. They are indispensable for the actual transformation of society. And to return to the classical statement of Marx and the German ideology, it is this very process of the revolutionary movement which also transforms the consciousness of human beings. Soviets are the historically discovered solution to the problem of how to make the mass of the population the master of its own destiny. This brings us to the crux of the issue. It is a result of the way class consciousness develops within the working class that the actual overthrow of capitalist rule will be carried out by a large minority led by a small minority. The party will be at the head of a, large mo a larger movement but overthrowing capitalist political domination and establishing a socialist society are two very different things. The first can be achieved by a movement in which communists play the overwhelming role. However, the question of constructing socialism is, a, is of an altogether different order. It requires that the majority of workers in every area of society are drawn into the creation of a new mode of production, a new political order, and ultimately a totally different type of society which has lost all trace of the muck of ages. In the course of this, the vast bulk of humanity will have their ideas transformed. The problem thrown up by the Russian experience is that the best intentions are no use if the material situation works against the proletariat. An example of, the, of this is the issue of party membership. In order to try to stop careerism, the party only recruited at those times when the civil war against the whites was going badly, so the consequences of joining the party might be fatal for any given individual. This was supposed to ensure that the party would maintain its revolutionary and proletarian purity, its revolutionary class consciousness. Laudable though this was, and it is difficult to see how the Bolsheviks could have acted better, the fact remained that less than 5% of the population of the old Russian Empire were working class. As many of these were already in the party or fighting in the Red Army, the scope for finding new recruits was limited. Despite this, as the party took on more and more of the functions of operating the system, more and more, more, and more were recruited. Party membership rose from tens of thousands in mid-1917 to three millions by 1921, but, but bureaucratism continued to be denounced at Soviet and party congresses. And all the way through the Civil War, the Soviets were dying as the most class conscious workers were fighting at the front. The experience of the Russian Revolution also highlights how fragile working class consciousness could be. The Soviets had come to power after four years of slaughter and economic disaster. Professor Edward Acton, who we have already quoted on the extremely dire economic situation in Russia at the end of 1917, describes it as akin to the Black Death in medieval Europe. The Bolsheviks might get out of the war and they might redistribute the land, but they could not magic up the bread that had been so lacking for the last two years. This took its toll on the enthusiasm of the working class who had supported the Bolshevik drive for Soviet power in 1917. 
as Mary Macaulay so graphically portrays it, in her work on the Russian Revolution, the workers were becoming apathetic as early as the spring of 1918. By the end of the year, in some factories, there were even some, admittedly a small minority, who called for the return of the Tsar. Sickness and starvation stalked the city. By March, with calorie consumption down to little more than 1,500 a day, there was a rash of strikes in the factories. It was a desperate time. The Bolsheviks had to muster all their resources to calm the angry workers, some of whom were spreading the slogan, down with Lenin and horse meat, give us the Tsar and pork. Lenin came from Moscow to address the question directly before a huge meeting at the People's House and a new rationing system was worked out. It was never quite so bad again, but the three quarters of a million inhabitants who survived the Civil War were emaciated and sick by the end of 1920. Years of near subsistence diet had taken their toll physically and psychologically. This passage seems to pose the question as to how the Bolsheviks remained in power at all. One factor was the undoubted loyalty of the vast majority of workers to the Soviet form even if this was not working in its original fashion. And there was the usual problem following a revolution of what constituted legitimate criticism and what was deemed to be subversive of the whole system. Here, the problem was compounded by the splits in the oppositions. The left SRs started off in the Soviet government, but left it via an act of terrorism. The Mensheviks split into at least three factions, some of whom accepted working in the Soviets like Martov's internationalists, whilst others went off to work with the opposition in the Civil War, but would then change their mind and return to work in the Soviet. In the face of this, the Bolsheviks themselves were split, with some insisting on the need to repress all, all opposition groups and others trying to create a new Soviet le legality. However, this debate also shows that the Bolsheviks were themselves already becoming identified with the state, <clears throat> a process which only intensified as the Civil War <coughs> as the Civil War made all opposition appear as potentially aiding the white enemy. But the whole thing posed a question for the Bolsheviks, which they did not really resolve. Mary Macaulay again poses the problem well. In Bolshevik eyes, it was the working class, led by their most advanced members in the Bolshevik party, that was going to build socialism. If the Petrograd workers should turn against or not follow the party, then the socialist endeavor would fail. The Bolsheviks needed the workers' support to justify their claim to rule. But what kind of support? From a bourgeois perspective, all that could be expected was passive acquiescence, but from the workers, far more was called for. Without their active participation, initiative, and sacrifice, socialism was unachievable. For thousands of working class activists who had become socialists under, under Tsarism, it meant self-education, self-discipline, and a willingness to sacrifice personal comfort and safety for the cause. At a minimum, the Bolshevik party needed the factory workers to vote for them rather than for the Mensheviks or SRs, and to pass factory resolutions in support of Bolshevik policies. And at times, they had to be content with that. But if that was all they could, they could count on was limited to these gestures from the followers, the socialist enterprise was doomed. Only if the workers were committed to a new way of working and living, particularly difficult and pre pre or present conditions, would socialism be built? The Bolsheviks could not do that for them. The Bolsheviks may have had some hangovers from the social democracy about the nature of socialism, but their proletarian opposition to the war revealed that they had broken with many social democratic ideas and were the best representatives of the working class at that time. The notion developed since the defeat of the Russian Revolution by latter-day councilists, but, but not by earlier councilists like Panikok, or by anarchists like Volin, that the Bolsheviks had a, a preconceived plan to create a party state simply does not stand up to closer examination. A 
critical analysis of Bolshevik errors finds that the debates inside the Bolsheviks about the future of the revolution at that time raised precisely the issues we are talking about today. It wasn't the lack of consciousness within the Russian working class movement that led to the disastrous outcome of the USSR, but the objective conditions in which the revolutionaries of the time operated. As the isolation of the Russian proletariat continued the decline of the revolution set in, or as the isolation of the Russian proletariat continued, the decline of the of the revolution set in. We can see this in the reports of contemporaries. In 1919, Arthur Ransom still found life in the grassroots functioning of provincial Soviets, but returning in 1920, he found that this had all but vanished. The increasing bureaucratism and the decline of real Soviet life led to the setting up of the Workers and Peasants Inspectorate, which was supposed to involve ordinary workers to act as a check on the bureaucracy. Its members were supposed to be elected by other workers in the same way as Soviet delegates, and membership was supposed to rotate to give as many proletarians, men and women, as much experience as possible. This was, in reality, a perfect recognition of the decline of the hopes for the Soviet democracy of 1917 to 18. As with all artificial solutions to a real problem, it achieved nothing except to give Stalin a further power base from which to inter interfere in every aspect of Soviet life. Despite criticism from all sides, Lenin still held out the prospect that it could be reformed as late as 1922. By 1923, partially because he had dimly seen the danger of Stalin, he was stating that he did not enjoy a vestige of authority and had joined those like Trotsky and Preobrazhensky who were calling for its overthrow. <coughs> the Russian Communist Left Equally disastrous was the decline of the way in which the party and state institutions functioned internally. To some, even amongst the communist left, the term democratic centralism has today been discredited. This is only because it has become distorted through the experience of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, as it later, later became. Originally, democratic centralism meant a dual process where policy was decided by the party from the bottom up and that it became incumbent on all members to carry it out. The members still had the right to criticize the policy internally, but it remained the policy until a subsequent decision of the whole party rejected it. The long drawn out debates over the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk show that the principle was still alive and well in 1918. At the Ninth Party Congress in March 1920, an opposition around Sapronov developed, taking the title Democratic Centralists, or Decists for short, calling for an end to the growing adoption of one-man management in all spheres of life. Sapronov stated that the supposed basis of the party and Soviet organs was democratic centralism, but this had been replaced by vertical centralism. He pointed to the shower of complaints from local bodies of encroaching interference from the center. But to illustrate the problems facing the Russian working class, the opposition agreed to the unhappy solution of a control commission where ordinary workers could denounce party members, however high up in the system. <clears throat> this was later to become the Rabkrin we have already criticized. This fact only confirms what we have been arguing. There are no solutions to problems which don't take into account the material reality of the situation. Contrary to the myth of the Bolshevik monolith, later maintained by Stalinist and liberal commentators alike, the opposition to the, de to the decline of the revolution within the Bolshevik party was stubborn and continuous throughout the Civil War period and even after it. There is hardly a party congress between the 8th in 1918 and the death of Lenin, where an opposition of one sort of or another is not able to speak. Even after the formal banning of factions at the 10th Congress in 1921, they continued to exist. This opposition, though, remained fairly weak. This is not because of the enormous prestige of Lenin, nor of the lack of talent of the opposition leaders. Bukharin, Radek, Priobrzezinski, Sapronov, Lomov, Ozinski, 
Platikov, Kolontai, Shlyapnikov, and Smimov were all involved at one time or another in trying to hold back the tide of counter-revolution. Some of these, like the left communists of 1918, the Democratic Centralists, the Workers' Truth Group, and the Communist Workers' Group, were, were politically the indirect ancestor, ancestors of much of the thinking of today's communist left. In one definition, these were distinguished by a characterization of social democracy and the Second inter International as capitalist organizations the left wing of the bourgeoisie, and therefore counter-revolutionary worldwide, i.e. not only in Russia. This was the basis of their opposition to the United Front. This represents a rejection of the notion of bourgeois workers' parties, which Lenin and others saw as the right wing of the workers' movement. Insistence on the Soviets and Soviet, Soviet democracy as the basis of the dictatorship of the proletariat, Opposition to substitutionism and the fusion of the party with the state apparatus. Opposition to the notion of state capitalism being a progressive and necessary stage in the struggle for communism. Opposition to the right of nations to self-determination and national liberation wars as reactionary. Support for all the defensive and economic struggles of the workers. Opposition to parliamentarism and participation in elections. Opposition to trade unionism in all its forms. But for all their clarity, the communist left, and indeed the other oppositions, could not resist the tide of counter-revolution that was sweeping not just Russia, but the entire world. Some of them, like Ozinski, did, however, argue that it would be better to separate party and state in order to preserve the clarity of the communist program. The theses of the left communists in 1918 clearly understood that the party itself could become the manager of the counter-revolution, and this to them would be the worst outcome, because that would mean that the revolutionary program would be lost. If there is no revolutionary program, there is no revolutionary party, and a whole generation is lost to the revolution. This prescience was actually too optimistic, since the nightmare that today's communists have to live with is the legacy of the degeneration of the revolution. Even before Stalin's time, and despite all the sound theoretical and organizational instincts of the Bolsheviks, the party gradually absorbed the state, the Soviets were reduced to rubber stamps, and then, after the fact, came the rationalization of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat, as the dictatorship of the proletariat. Even here, there was a gradual process of shifting the meaning of the phrase. When Lenin first defended the idea of the dictatorship of the party in 1919, he also said that the party's ideas can only be carried out in reality by the new body, the Soviets. But by December 1920, the very month in which the civil war against the whites and allied imperialism was won, he was stating, the dictatorship of the proletariat cannot be exercised through an organization embracing the whole of that class. Because in all capitalist countries, and not only over here in one of the most backward, the proletariat is still so divided, so degraded, and so corrupted that an organization taking in the whole of the proletariat cannot directly exercise proletarian dictatorship. It can be exercised only by a vanguard that has absorbed the revolutionary energy of the class. This is mysticism, not materialism. It is more in common with the fascist myth that the Führer Deus is the real expression of the will of the nation than with the Marxist materialist Lenin of 1917 to 18. Nor was Lenin consistent in his declining years. At the 11th Party Congress in March 1922, he seems to have realized that it had all gone terribly wrong. And if we take that huge bureaucratic machine, that gigantic heap, we must ask who is directing whom. I doubt very much whether it can be truthfully said that, that that communists are directing that heap. To tell the truth, they are not directing, they are being directed. Those were virtually Lenin's last words on the condition of the revolution, and naturally they were brushed aside. Indeed, now that the party dictatorship was accepted, it remained only for Lenin's successors to pronounce their own dictatorship. Zinoviev 
at the 12th Party Congress, went on to argue that not only was it a good thing to have the dictatorship of, dictatorship of the party, but in Lenin's absence, went one stage further. We need a single, strong, powerful Central Committee, which is leader of everything. The Central Committee is the Central Committee because it is the same Central Committee for the Soviets and for the trades union and for the cooperatives and for the provincial executive committees and for the whole working class. In this consists its role of leadership. In this, it expresses the dictatorship of the party. And by 1928, of course, the general secretary would express the, the dictatorship of the proletariat. The idea that communism was about the withering away of the state had itself long since withered away. The communist left had issued a siren call to warn of the process, but in the dangerous situation of 1918 to 1921, they had been ignored. With no world revolution to reverse the situation, a purely Russian solution could not be socialist, and Lenin had never pretended that socialism had even been minimally established in Russia. The end of the Civil War posed a new situation for the Bolsheviks, but as they were working out a response, the Kronstadt Commune rose to demand a change of policy. Obsessed with the idea that Kronstadt would fall into white or allied hands, the RCP did not negotiate seriously and went in for military repression. Bolsheviks and Kronstadt divided and some fought their own party comrades. Thousands went into exile and thousands more were arrested and some were shot. The tragedy was compounded by the fact that within a few days, the RCP 10th Congress or 10th Party Congress adopted the new economic policy or NEP which followed the lines of the Kronstadter's main economic demands. The introduction of NEP was basically a restoration of the capitalist market, but it was a success if judged in terms of its effects. The fact that there were no more Kronstadts was not just due to the increase of Cheka repression, but also to a decline of revolutionary activity throughout the working class. The improved material conditions under NEP led workers to gradually abandon demands for more revolutionary policies and properly functioning Soviets. Increasingly, the state was able to mobilize the masses of workers behind its campaigns. This was the anti-revolutionary trade-off. In return for improved living standards, workers' revolutionary consciousness was gradually abandoned. The road to Stalinism gradually opened up. All the opposition's attempts to reassert communist ideas foundered in the face of a working class which had faced seven years of imperialist war, disease, and famine, and which now wanted nothing more than a better standard of living. Revolutionary consciousness, as we have shown, is a fragile thing which can disappear as, rapid, as rapidly as it arrives. The fact that Russian workers had sustained their revolutionary dreams for so long is a testimony to both their tenacity and their class consciousness. We, we reject the idea that the failure of the Russian Revolution was primarily because of the a priori attitudes of the Bolsheviks. But, we, what, but what we today suffer from is the fact that the vanguard did not remain a vanguard of the class. It merged with the state apparatus of a single territory. It thus ceased to be able to maintain a communist program for the international stage. This has to be the role of the communist vanguard of the future. It has to be international and centralized and to stick to the task of holding up the revolutionary program on an international stage. It is to this aspect of class consciousness and political organization that we turn in our next chapter. Chapter nine, the idealism of Bordigism. So far, we have been arguing that for the working class, a class without a form of property to develop or defend, the only permanent way it can unite is in the form of an organization with a program that expresses its revolutionary consciousness. Thus, a political organization like a party is an inevitable product of a revolutionary working class. However significant this party becomes numerically, it will always remain a minority 
since we hold to Marx's view that it is only in the process of revolution itself that the majority of the class will have their view of the world transformed. The actual preparation for and leading of the overthrow of the capitalist state worldwide, therefore, are tasks for which the class struggle creates an international party. However, as we saw earlier, the nature of that party and its relationship to the class was not clearly understood by most social democrats. It was still an issue in both the communist international and in the debates in the Italian left, trying to get to grips with an unprecedented counter-revolution. It is to this we now turn. <clears throat> the Communist International The most revolutionary international political organization created in the, re in the revolutionary wave after the First World War was the Communist International. The Communist or Third International was set up in Moscow in 1919. It had originally been planned to hold the founding Congress in Germany, but the premature revolt of the Spartacists and their subsequent massacre led to that option being ruled out. <coughs> the life of the International really began with the Second Congress in 1920. The theses on the role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution reaffirmed the basic Marxist position on the relation of the party to the development of the class struggle. Although the Darwinian reference to the process of natural selection might have been omitted. 1. The Communist Party is a part of the working class, namely the most advanced, most class conscious, and hence revolutionary part. By a process of natural selection, the Communist Party is formed of the best, most class conscious, most devoted, and far sighted workers. The Communist Party has no interests other than the interests of the working class as a whole. The Communist Party is differentiated from the working class as a whole by the fact that it has a clear view of the entire historical path of the working class in its totality and endeavors. At every bend in this road to defend the interests not of separate groups or trades, but of the working class as a whole. The theses also went on to underline the significance of the role of the Communist Party in relation to the class-wide organs like the Workers' Councils or Soviets. The rise of the Soviets as the historically discovered basic form of the, of the dictatorship of the proletariat does not in any way diminish the leading role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution. When the German left communists say, see their appeal to the German proletariat of April 14, 1920, signed Communist Workers' Party of Germany, that the party too must adopt itself more and more to the so Soviet idea and assume a proletarian character. This is a confused expression of the idea that the Communist Party should merge in the Soviets and that the Soviets should replace the Communist Party. This idea is basically wrong and reactionary. There was a period in the history of the Russian Revolution when the Soviets were opposed to the proletarian party and supported the policy of the agents of the bourgeoisie. The same was true of Germany. The same is possible in other countries too. In order that the Soviets may be able to achieve their historical tasks, a strong communist party is essential. A party which does not simply adapt itself to the Soviets, but is able to ensure that Soviets do not adapt themselves to the bourgeoisie and to white guard social democracy, a party which through its fractions in the Soviets is able to make them follow it. And now, and, or sorry, and how could it be otherwise, unless we think that communist consciousness is generated by anyone other than those parts of the working class which are already fighting to change the system. The theses though remain silent on the precise relationship between the party and the Soviet and this would turn out to be a significant omission. What the Russian Revolution taught us was that the building of socialism, the actual changing of the mode of production, can only be achieved by the majority of the working class themselves, through their class-wide organs, in the Russian case the Soviets. If the Soviets fail to adopt and carry out communist measures, then the revolutionary situation has passed. There is no way that the party can take on this role itself. What the party is not is a government in waiting, in the sense that bourgeois parties are, 
nor does it take on the role and functions of the state. When the Bolsheviks initially came to power, they had some understanding of this. Lenin constantly exhorted workers in the first few months after October 1917 to build socialism themselves, because no one can do it for you. The clearest sign that the counter-revolution was on the march came when the Bolsheviks faced with the need to create a standing army, the Red Army, to fight the whites in international imperialism in the Civil War of 1918-21, to embarked on the path of state building. Accompanying this was the creation of a vast bureaucracy which, in time, became part of a new ruling class, with even, after the Second World War, the right to pass on hereditary privileges. After Kronstadt, many Bolsheviks concluded that the party was the state and began to theoretically justify party rule as in the best interests of the working class. Marx's dictatorship of the proletariat was interpreted as dictatorship of the party. This was not fully understood at the time, and this partial understanding is reflected in the theses on the role of the Communist Party in the proletarian revolution. Whilst Theses 9 and 11 are correct in seeing the need for the Communist Party to continue in existence until the final abolition of class society, Thesis 10 is more a description of the existing state of affairs in the RSFSR rather than a theoretical analysis of the path to international proletarian emancipation emancipation. It ends. In the organization of a new proletarian Red Army and the real destruction of the bourgeois state apparatus and its replacement by the beginnings of a new proletarian state apparatus, in the fight against narrow craft tendencies among groups of workers, and the struggle against local and regional patriotism, in clearing the way for the creation of a, of a new labor discipline, in all these fields the Communist Party has the, the decisive word. By their own example, the members must inspire and lead the majority of the working class. Sure, the Communist Party members must inspire the rest of the working class, but the references to the proletarian state apparatus are already pointing in the wrong direction. In the state and revolution, Lenin had understood that the working class would produce at most a semi-state, which would lose its oppressive character with the suppression of the last exploiting class in history. But this was written in 1917, and the reality was that from 1918 on, the proletarian experience in Russia was already in retreat. And by 1920, the confusion between party and state was already undermining the idea that the international extension of the revolution was the main task of the Communist Party. Whilst its members can inspire and lead the majority of the working class in the Soviets, the party as a body is not an institution of any existing territory conquered by the working class. Its task is to spread the international revolution. In this sense, it was tragic that the Comintern's founding Congress was not held in Germany as had originally been planned. This would have, un would have underlined that the Communist International was an instrument of world revolution and not an arm of the Russian state as it inevitably became once the revolutionary wave had retreated. As it was, the Communist International did become part of the apparatus of a new state and increasingly became an instrument of its foreign policy in the struggle with the imperialist states, into whose orbit the new state was forced to gradually operate. And this is precisely where the distinction between party and state has to be made. If the Soviets in any given proletarian bastion need to create red armies or other institutions which are part of a new state, that is a temporary step backwards that they might be forced to take. Even if its own members are involved in the debates in those Soviets, the party as a body remains outside that process. In Russia, the civil war and the decimation of the original revolutionary class meant that, as we saw in previous chapters, the party took on more and more state roles. Worse still, the identification of the party with the state and not with the international proletarian struggle also undermined the prospects for defending communism on a global scale. The consequences of this failure live with us today. And it was in the international sphere that the ancestors of today's communist left, and therefore of the internationalist communist tendency, first emerged as a distinct tendency. There's a lot of confusion surrounding this, both in theoretical and historical terms. 
So we need to look at this here. At the same time, the debates in the internationalist community left also ho uh, hold on. Debates in the internationalist communist left also highlights the need to look at the nature of the class party itself. The Italian left. If the error of those who today look for inspiration to the councilless currents that pay homage to, to the German left is to deny the need for any organi I, for what the need for in organization which gives expression to our revolutionary class consciousness, the error of those who emerged from the Italian left, whom we today call Bordigists, is to see the party as not only the instrument of revolutionary leadership, but also as the organ of rule after the revolution. They arrive at this position by a very neat piece of logic which is undialectical in that it just happens to leave out the context in which communism will have to be built. Whilst capitalist democracy depends for its functioning on the passivity of the workers, the future communist semi-state will be totally different from anything seen previously. It can only succeed via the active involvement of the majority of the working class. Its only justification for existence is the continuing existence of hostile social classes. Once these are no more and a classless society emerges, the state will wither away and the organs of political rule will become organs of rational economic decision making. The society of freely associated producers foreseen in the communist manifesto. However, this is to anticipate our argument. In the 1920s, our ancestors in the Communist Party of Italy, a party founded by the left under the leadership of the redoubtable figure of Amadeo Bordiga, shared a common critique of the, de of the degeneration of the Third International. For them, the adoption of the Third Congress of the Comintern in 1921 of the slogan to the masses was not necessarily an error since it depended on what, what going to the masses meant. If it meant uniting all workers in common struggles, that was fine. But if it meant united fronts with the leaders of the very socialist parties, which had already refused to join the communist international for the very good reason that they were against revolution, then that was not only opportunism, but even a der dereliction of class duty. The Italian left did not, however, split over this, but continued to fight to keep the common turn on the path of international revolution. They persisted in seeing themselves as a section of an internationally centralized party. Indeed, it could be argued that they took this principle to extremes since they accepted that as they were in a minority within the international in fighting the United Front policies adopted at the fourth common turn Congress in 1922, then it was logical for the common turn leadership, which was naturally dominated by the Russian party to replace Bordega and the left as the leaders of the Italian party even though there was an overwhelming majority for both Bordiga and the positions of the left in the Italian party. Even the entry of Cerati's Socialist Party centrists into the party did not undermine the popularity of the left and Grams Gramsci, chosen by the common turn to lead the PCD International um, when Bordiga was imprisoned by the fascists had to resort to methods Stalin would have been proud of in 1926 at the Lyons Congress to ensure that the common turns line was accepted. The Red Two Years, 1919 to 1920. It was the tradition of the Italian left communists around Bordiga which gave the most coherent support to the revolutionary ideas of Marx on class and class consciousness. At the time of the factory occupation in Turin in 1919 to 20, Bordiga had already argued against the Ordinov, Ordinovisti led by Gramsci, that the economic struggle of the class, even if it was for control of the means of production, was quite compatible with the bourgeois order and did not generate its own independent socialist consciousness. Further, Bordiga restated the Marxist axiom that the dominant ideas are those of the ruling class, and that under conditions of capitalist exploitation, a majority of the proletariat cannot become conscious communists. Only by forming a political party of necessity grouping a minority of the class could the proletariat begin to assert its ideological independence from the ruling class. The party, by distilling 
and restoring to the class its own historical experience and the lessons thereof could bring about the transformation of sparks of consciousness of individual workers into the revolutionary class consciousness necessary for overthrowing the capitalist order. In that same revolutionary process led by the party, ever greater layers of the proletariat would, in the course of a practical movement, raise their consciousness to that of its advanced guard. The results of the great class battles of the Italian workers of 1919 to 20 confirmed this analysis. Whilst Gramsci was lauding the factory occupations of the Biennio Rosso, read two years, as Soviets, Bordiga correctly pointed out that these were more like factory committees rather than Soviets or class-wide organs of workers' rule. Bordiga also argued against the idea that the factory committees could manage production and make capitalism irrelevant without challenging the capitalist political system. We would not like the working masses to get the idea that all they need to do to take over the factories and get rid of the capitalists is to set up councils. These futile and continual outbursts which are daily exhausting the masses must be merged together, organized into one great comprehensive effort which aims directly at the heart of the enemy bourgeoisie. This function can and must only be exercised by the Communist Party which, at the present moment, has not and must not have any other task than that of directing its activity to making the working masses more conscious of the necessity for this political step. This is the only direct way they will gain possession of the factory, while to proceed otherwise will be to struggle in vain. These turned out to be prophetic words when the massive spontaneous struggles of the class failed to challenge the state, failed to generate socialist consciousness, and instead trapped in the, in the ideology of self-management were led to defeat. Bordiga now criticized the idea of consciousness emerging from forms of economic struggle. A totally wrong interpretation of Marxist determinism and a limited conception of the part played by consciousness and will in the formation, under the original influence of economic factors of the revolutionary forces, led a great many people to look for a mechanical system of organization which by itself would be enough to make the masses move towards revolution with the maximum revolutionary efficiency. It is correct to say that the daily class struggle does not produce communist understandings automatically in the whole class. It does not even produce it automatically in any single proletarian. Even those proletarians such as Wheatling and Ditskin, who contributed to socialist thinking, did so by scientific study of working class history and the restoration of its lessons to the class by political action. The conditions of proletarian existence enable only a minority to be receptive to such doctrines under capitalist exploitation. This leads to the formation of a party and the transformation of the workers' experience into consciousness and will. The class originates from an immediate homogeneity of economic interests which appear as the primary motive force of the tendency to destroy and go beyond the present mode of production. But in order to assume this task, the class must have its own thought, its own critical method, its own will bent on precise ends by research and criticism, and its own organization of struggle, channeling and utilizing with the utmost efficiency its collective efforts and sacrifices. All this constitutes the party. The Errors of Bordigism there were, however, some distortions in Bordiga's view of class consciousness. In the years of counter-revolution, during which Bordiga avoided all contact with his comrades in the Italian left, these errors hardened into political positions which eventually turned out to be a step backwards. Bordiga was quite right to insist that one cannot speak of communist consciousness in the proletariat or of the independence of the class until we can recognize a social tendency or a movement oriented towards a given end, then we can recognize the existence of a class in the true sense of the word, but then the party exists in a material, if not yet in a formal way. But it is quite wrong to move from this point and to assert that if the class party does not exist, then the class itself does not exist. Or as he put it, one cannot even speak of a class unless a minority of this class tending to organize itself into a political party has come into existence. 
From this, it is but a logical short step to seeing the class in itself, struggling economically at the level of class identity as being simply a class for capital and its experience as worthless. In the conception of Bordiga's heirs, the International Communist Party, the program becomes a set of commandments divorced from class experience, or at best merely confirmed by it, rather than, as in the living Marxist conception, being enriched by it. Marxist theory is one invariant block from its origins to its final victory. The only thing it expects from history is to find itself more and more strictly applied and consequently more and more deeply engraved with its invariant features. Apart from sounding like a piece of Hegelian teleology, this insistence on invariance appears to ignore not only the theoretical advances and changes Marx made in his views in the course of his reflection on the development of the class struggle, but also the contribution of the class action towards the enriching of the communist program. For example, Marx's position on the state from that of taking it over to that of smashing it came directly from the experience of the Paris Commune of 1871. It is quite true to say that though it was the Parisian workers who stormed heaven in that year, it was Marx on the basis of the experience of the Commune who developed the theory of the proletarian dictatorship and not the Paris workers, either individually or collectively. Nevertheless, it was the concrete class experience which furnished the basis for the development of Marx's theory, in this case as in others. Party and Class However, the, mis the misformulations in Bordigas' positions, which later flourished as caricatures in the various Bordigas international communist parties, have not remained unchallenged in the tradition of the Italian left. The recognition that it is necessary for the working class to struggle and create a class party which encapsulates its revolutionary class consciousness has always been defended by our comrades of the Internationalist Communist Party. They strongly argued that this party cannot be the product of the last minute, but has to exist to defend communist positions within the working class before any revolutionary outbreak. However, however small and unpopular, its appeal under normal capitalist conditions of exploitation. It was with this understanding that the internationalist Communist Party was founded by Honorado Damon, Luciano Stefanini, or Moro, and others in clandestinity in 1943. It soon attracted most of those members of the Italian left who had survived the attacks of Stalinism, Nazism, and fascism, either inside or outside Italy. Bordiga, who had said nothing political since 1927, at first did not support it. He initially counseled his supporters to enter the Stalinist Italian Communist Party, PCI, of Togliatti, but eventually the success of the new party attracted his support. However, his ideas had by now fossilized, and he soon began to argue against the founding tenets of the, of the P PC International. There were many issues over which he split the party in 1951, but the issue of the nature and role of the party was one of the most significant. Whilst the Bordigists, as they are known henceforth, argued that the proletarian state can only be animated by a single party, the Communist Party will rule alone and will never give up power without a physical struggle. The Internationalist Communist Party argued in their political platform of 1952 that there is no possibility of working class emancipation nor of the construction of a new social order if this does not emerge from the class struggle. At no time and for no reason does the proletariat abandon its combative role. It does not delegate to others its historical mission, and it does not give power away to anyone, not even to its political party. Bordigasm seems ossified around the theses of the Common Turn in 1920, which were already, as we have seen, affected by the transformation of the Russian party into a new ruling class. Indeed, Bordigasm's invariant communist program seems to suffer from a selective kind of invariance. The idea that the workers need a one-party state is added to their dogma, 
but the possibility that Soviets offer in creating a semi-state which will wither away once the bourgeoisie has suppressed is a dangerous or bourgeoisie art suppressed is a dangerous novelty. However, criticizing Bordigist errors is relatively easy. It is more difficult to go on from this and elaborate a coherent Marxist position on class consciousness. Since we feel our comrades have done so, we can do no better than allow them to speak for themselves. Once again, we return to the essential point of communist doctrine according to which there is a great difference between class instinct and class consciousness. Um, this is a quote from Prometeo, by the way, that I am currently reading. The first is born and devel develops within the workers' struggles as a patrimony of the workers themselves. It comes from the antagonism of material interests and is nourished by the growing economic, social, and political conditions brought about by this antagonism. The second consciousness is born out of the scientific examination of class contradictions. It grows with the growth of knowledge of these contradictions. It lives and is nourished by the examination and elaboration of facts coming from the historic experiences of the class. Socialist consciousness is scientific reflection on the experiences of the class and on the problems it poses, developed by, by those who have the means to undertake this reflection and who identify themselves politically with the class. This discussion takes us back to the issues posed in the first two chapters. The apparent contradiction between Marx's ideas that the dominant ideas are everywhere those of the ruling class, yet the emancipation of the working class must be the task of the workers themselves, is resolved only by recognizing proletarian organization is twofold. It first needs a political instrument which unites and elaborates its collective anti-capitalist consciousness. This body transforms the abstract lessons of proletarian past experience into a concrete program of class action. Second, it needs class-wide bodies, which, when they take on the communist program, are the real means of transformation of society. The very existence of these organizations is not a guarantee of proletarian victory, but without both of them or other as yet undiscovered organizations like them, we cannot even talk of a real possibility of success. The nature of a class party. One other issue which arises naturally from the Bordigist split from the PC International is the nature of the class party. Most people who support the idea of proletarian emancipation but who reject the idea of the party also base their view on the negative experiences of the past. This is particularly true of the, of the evolution of the Bolshevik party into the Stalinist monster it became in the 1930s. This evolution began before the death of Lenin and, as we have seen, was intimately connected with the party becoming the state itself. The banning of factions at the 10th Party Congress of 1921 has enormous significance in this respect because it also represented the Bolshevik abandonment of one of its previous greatest strengths, which was the existence of a multiplicity of opinions within it. It was the Bolsheviks' lack of monolithism which was the source of their dynamism within the working class. The Bolsheviks' pre-revolutionary orientation to the working class and its almost isolated stance on turning imperialist war into civil war were the bedrocks for its for transformation into real instruments into real instruments of the class in 1917. Bolshevism did not spring from the pages of what is to be done, but from its direct appeal to the rising level of class consciousness as the war progressed. The significant point from the episode is that the party, however small, and the Bolsheviks had only 8,000 members in February 1917, has to exist prior to a general revolutionary event. By maintaining the revolutionary program produced by the historic experience of the working class within the working class, however unpopular this can appear to the short term, it can become the vehicle around which the working class can rally in its initial assault on capitalism. Inside the Bolshevik party, the guiding principle was that of democratic centralism. This meant that the party leadership was elected by its members and that key policy issues were decided by Congresses of the entire membership. In the years before 1917 and right up until 1921, the Bolshevik party was characterized by sharp disagreements and serious but lively debates at all levels. 
It was this capacity for rank and file initiative which helped to make Bolshevism such a dynamic force within the working class. This rank and file activity was actually a better guarantee of a healthy internal life than democratic centralism, since with the falling off of logical initiative during the Civil War, the party began to, de to degenerate. Under Stalin, the final touches to this degeneration meant distorting the party's own history. Monolithism and discipline came to be identified and praised as the sources of the party's success in 1917. This rewriting of the real history of Bolshevism was central to the Stalinist myth of the omniscient party and great leader. The democratic element in democratic centralism was first undermined by Stalin's control over appointments of local party secretaries who rigged elections, and then by the system of patronage which completed the transformation of what had once been a fighting force for revolution into a new ruling class. Democratic centralism understood only as Stalinist centralism still makes the term obnoxious to many people today. The key issue is not what you call it, but the recognition that there not only has to be some mechanism for the party members to decide on the policy and direction of their own party, the, the toleration of factions and even tendencies and the mechanism for ensuring internal democracy are basic to ensuring the vitality of a revolutionary organization. Faced with its own struggle against the degeneration of the common turn, the Italian left also gave some attention to this issue. As democratic centralism was being turned into its opposite through the process of Bolshevization, i.e. Stalinism, they put forward the idea that something more was needed. In the communist left's theses to the Lyons Congress of the Communist Party of Italy, they wrote, Another aspect of the call for Bolshevization is that complete centralization of discipline and the strict prohibition of fractions are considered the secure guarantee of the party's effectiveness. The final court of appeal for all controversial questions is the central international organ, within which at least political, if not hierarchical, hegemony is attributed to the Russian Communist Party. Actually, this guarantee is non-existent, and the whole approach to the problem is inadequate. In fact, rather than preventing the spread of fractions within the international, it has been encouraged to assume masked and hypocritical forms instead. From a historical point of view, the overcoming of fractions in the Russian party wasn't an expedient nor a magical recipe applied on statutory grounds but was both the result and the expression of a faithful delineation of the problems of doctrine and political action. Disciplinary sanctions are one of the elements that ensure against degeneration, but only on condition that their application remains within the limits of exceptional cases and doesn't become the norm and virtually the ideal of the party's functioning. The solution doesn't reside in a useless increase in hierarchical authoritarianism, whose initial investiture is lacking both because of the incompleteness of the historical experiences in Russia, impressive though they are, and because even within the old guard, the custodian of the Bolshevik traditions, disagreements have been resolved in ways which cannot be considered as a priori the best ones. But neither does the solution lie in the systematic application of the principles of formal democracy, which for Marxism have no other function than it as organizational practices, which can be occasionally convenient. The communist parties must achieve an organic centralism, which, whilst including maximum possible consultation with the base, ensures a spontaneous elimination of any grouping which aims to differentiate itself. This cannot be achieved with, as Lenin put it, the formal and mechanical prescriptions of a, hier of a hierarchy, but through correct revolutionary politics. This search for a new organizational formula is entirely understandable given, a, given the de degeneration of both the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and the Common Turn. Thus, the Italian left came up with the idea that something more than mere democratic centralism was needed to give new revolutionary life to the decaying bodies of the October Revolution. 
Since Stalin had stitched up the voting in the Russian party and in most other parties, Democratic, which by this time was no longer any such thing, centralism just played into the hands of the executive bodies. The idea of organic centralism was supposed to ensure that there would be more discussion and more debate inside the common turn and its parties. However, the real problem was a historical one. The counter-revolution had brought the proletarian revolutionary wave of 1917-21 to to a halt, and the forces of conservatism had overtaken not only the capitalists, but also a common turn which had become the mere foreign office of the USSR. Needless to say, the theses of the left were rejected by the Gramscian leadership, who managed to stitch up the vote by threatening to remove the income of the professional revolutionaries who made up part of the delegations. The left were then expelled from the party they had founded. The idea of organic centralism was thus buried for the next 25 years. It re-emerged in the post-war world only when the Bordigist current formed inside the Internationalist Communist Party, the real historic heir of the Italian left, revived it as part of the process of their split from the PC International. However, this revival of organic centralism was in a more authoritarian direction than the original thesis. This came out in the exchange between Honorado Damon, principal founder of the PC International, and Bordiga. Damon argued that organic centralism, as defined by Bordiga, was a recipe for dictatorship within the party. In fact, Bordiga had taken the concept a stage fur further than the Leon's thesis, which called for voting or formal democracy when such things became necessary. Now, Bordiga was arguing that the party pursues the aim of re-establishing an always wider contact with the exploited masses, and it eliminates from its structure one of the starting errors of the Moscow International by getting rid of democratic centralism and of any voting mechanism, as well as every last member eliminating from its, his ideology any concession to democra democratoid, pacifist, autonomist, or libertarian trends. Damon does not totally reject the organic aspect of centralism, but restates the case that although democratic centralism is not perfect, it is the only healthy way in which the relationship between the membership of a world proletarian party and its elected leadership between freedom and authority can be maintained. In other words, at some point when discussion does not arrive at a consens consensus, issues inevitably have to be settled by votes of the membership. Bordiga justified his rejection of democratic centralism on the grounds that it was only employed by the parties of the Third International because they were impure, but as Damon pointed out, no such pure communist parties will ever exist, as even in the most advanced workers lurk all kinds of capitalist hangovers, which will only be expunged under a different mode of production. Lenin's International certainly had its weaknesses. Due to the immaturity of the historical period that followed the collapse of the Second International and the crisis then afflicting the capitalist world, every proletarian organization reproduces, though in a more advanced way and on an inversely proportional scale, the characteristics of the historical period in which it was formed, and it is certain that the negative aspects present, present in the Third International will be present although differently articulated in future international organizations as amply proved by the objective conditions in which the various left communist groupings who today claim the right to make a contribution to the reconstruction of the international proletarian party are operating. Amongst these groups, the one that suffers most from intolerance in crises is the Bordigists. Communist program, where the dynamics of democratic centralism work more deeply as seen in the explosive cycle of its internal contradictions. He also argued that this mechanism is essential within the party to ensure that its members are properly prepared for the revolutionary struggle. This advocacy of democratic centralism has nothing to do with Stalinism, which hid behind the term to maintain pure centralism with nothing democratic about it. As the quotation above shows, he argued that Bordiga's contempt for democracy within the party was not, not only closer to Stalinism, but had already had serious consequences for his followers after the original split in 1952. 
The Bordigas current has split several times in its history, partly as demon maintains above because of the consequences of attempting to maintain an artificial organic centralism. Each split claiming to be the one true embodiment of the proletarian vanguard, just as there is no royal road, road to science, as Marx remarked in his introduction to capital, so too there is no shortcut to communism. Its establishment will only come once the proletariat has fully digested and understood the lessons of its previous struggles and defeats. In the meantime, this leaves scope in its revolutionary vanguards for debate and discussion on the road to our emancipation as a class. This is why it is not only important to agree that discussion and debate within the party are needed, it also has to be actively encouraged. Obviously, this does not mean that there are no limits to discussion, but at each stage in the historic struggle of the working class, the lessons of its past fight, its past fight prepare a series of parameters in which such a, uh, such a debate can take place. Within these parameters, whether enshrined in platform or program, the maximum degree of freedom has to be maintained in order that a real fighting organ of the working class can develop. Factions and tendencies, which will inevitably rise and fall in the course of the struggle against capitalism, have not merely to be tolerated, but given full rights of debate. As Damon argued in the text already quoted, it is, in this constant dialectical relationship between the membership and leadership of the party, in this necessary integration of freedom and authority lies the solution to the problem. A party has to have a centralized unity in action to defeat the class enemy, but a meaningful unity is not arrived at without constant dialogue between its members. This is just one of the many lessons we have to take from the period of counter-revolution. The history of Bordigism demonstrates that, tragically, it has learned nothing and forgotten nothing as Napoleon once said of the Bourbon monarchy. Chapter 10, by way of conclusion, towards world proletarian revolution. This is the introduction for the conclusion. An understanding of the nature of working class consciousness, the manner in which it arises and the way in which that consciousness becomes a material force in history is the most important issue for defining the nature of revolutionary action. In this pamphlet, we have tried to relate the theoretical acquisitions gained by revolutionaries to the practical material movement of the working class itself. Whilst the very existence of the working class and its struggles in the early 19th century in Europe provided Marx and Engels with the raw material for the basic theory of how working class consciousness arises, the German ideology and the Communist Manifesto were only the, the beginning of the definition of the question. The word was made flesh by the subsequent actions of the working class in the Paris Commune, in the mass strikes of 1905 and in the 1917 Russian Revolution itself. This is why it is not good enough to quote what Marx and Engels wrote in the past, as though they were a set of commandments handed down by some deity. Whilst the basic method and framework of Marx and Engels remains eminently defensible even today, the problem which they raised, the problems which they raised, have turned out to be infinitely more complex than the two great thinkers could possibly have anticipated. Although they had begun to sense that the social democratic parties that claimed the title Marxist were increasingly anti-revolutionary, they could not have remotely foreseen the extent to which social democracy and the trades unions would become a force for capitalist preservation. And despite Engels' insight in anti-during that the transformation either into joint stock companies or into state ownership does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces. Neither of them could have anticipated the extent to which capitalist states at the heart of the system would respond to the threat of working class struggle by mitigating the worst aspects of exploitation through state intervention. Nor could anyone have predicted that the first attempt by the proletariat to launch an international revolution in 1917 would be isolated to a single geographical entity and that the party created by the proletariat in that revolution would be the same force that would carry out the counter-revolution. As we demonstrated in chapters 7 and 8, this was overwhelmingly due to the material situation of isolation of the revolution. 
counter-revolution did not occur overnight, but was a gradual process which contemporaries were concerned about, but they could not at the same time foresee exactly how each expedient measure to hold the Russian Socialist Federated Soviet Republic together was actually one more nail in the coffin of international proletarian revolution. In the RSFSR itself, the so-called Civil War, which lasted three years following the signing of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, decimated the revolutionary class. The most class-conscious workers went into the Red Army, or the party, party come state apparatus, and the abandonment of the main cities by millions searching for survival took the heart out of Soviet power. The Soviets became empty shells by 1920. Many Russian communists tried to get round this by insisting that the dictatorship of the proletariat party was the same thing as the, the dictatorship of the proletariat, but such a position undermines the revolutionary core of Marxism. Such illusions were the building bricks on which Stalinism would be constructed. By way of conclusion to this pamphlet, we would like to link the proletarian position on the question of consciousness, i.e. how the revolution can come about, to the consequences of the Russian Revolution and its aftermath in order to arrive at a workable and meaningful position for today. The revolutionary position restated. Let's start with the problem posed by the decline of the revolution in Russia. Marx was always clear that the communist revolution, unlike all previous historical movements, was the self-conscious independent movement of the immense majority. At the same time, Marx was also clear that this movement could only constitute itself as a class movement through a political party. For Marx, this was axiomatic. The problem of, cla of class consciousness for the working class is that it has no property form to defend. Therefore, unlike the bourgeoisie, its class consciousness cannot arise automatically from the extension of its form of property. The economic struggle of the working class poses the question of the nature of exploitation but does not of itself provide the answer to the question of how to end that exploitation. The fractured nature of the way in which different groups and individuals came to class consciousness at different times means that only through the creation of some permanent political body can that consciousness be consolidated and spread. The political party of those workers who understand the historical nature of the class struggle, that it is more than just a struggle for a fair day's wage but for an entirely new way of life is the only way in which the ruling ideas can be challenged. By putting together all the sparks of consciousness produced by the daily struggle against capitalist exploitation, the party can make the ideas of the proletariat a material force in the political fight to overthrow the capitalist state. It cannot come spontaneously from the daily struggle of the class alone. What was less clear in Marx's time was what the nature of this party was to be as well as what its relationship to the mass of the class was. The experience of social democracy, including that of the Bolsheviks, show that the proletarian party should be programmatically clear rather than numerically large in advance of the revolution. Whilst German social democracy became the largest political party of its epoch, it did this at a cost. Although Rosa Luxemburg and others had carried on a struggle against reformists and revisionists like Bernstein, because of, as a former protege of Engels, he seemed more dangerous as an opponent of revolution. The German Social Democratic Party and its trades unions actually had much worse figures who were saturated with imperialist, racist, and even downright pro-capitalist attitudes. The SPD right were to be the final murderers of Luxembourg. Even if the so-called Marxists, like Kotsky, had helped prepare the way by failing to carry out all the anti-war resolutions of the Second International. Indeed, it was the very narrowness of the Bolsheviks, and it is no accident that their Bulgarian allies were called the Tesniaki or narrow ones, which was to ensure that they maintained class positions, and even this was not without sharp ideological differences. Kamenev, for example, thought the, that the overthrow of the Tsar in March 1917 meant that the Bolsheviks could now support the war. Asserting that the proletarian party should be programmatically clear rather than numerically large on the eve of revolution obviously requires some explanation. If the proletarian revolution is the, mo the movement of the immense majority, how can it be led by a minority? 
The answer obviously has to be a bit schematic, since in real life, historical processes never unfold as par paradigmatically as the attempts we make to understand them. Broadly speaking, the key to it lies in revolutions, or in, sorry, in the word process. Revolutions, and indeed all great social movements, always begin somewhere with a limited caste. Gradually, more and more people are drawn into this process as the movement extends both geographically and politically. The first event of any revolution will be some spontaneous development, which flows from an economic and social crisis of capitalism. It is likely that it may not even be apparent to the participants that what they are launching is a revolution. All they will know is that they cannot go on living in the old way. The unconscious comes before the conscious. However, whilst spontaneity can launch a movement, the key to a successful revolution is that the movement goes beyond mere anti-capitalism to acquire a programmatic alternative goal. As we have argued throughout this pamphlet, only those workers who have embraced an organized conscious alternative to capitalism are in a position to move the revolt on towards a new society. It cannot be otherwise. If there is no communist program for the new movement to seize, it will eventually take on some or other capitalist banner, as in Poland in the 1980s, when the alternative to fighting Stalinism with the Catholic, was the Catholic Church, as there was no real communist party present, and there was the additional mystification that the system was already seen to be communist. However, we are not arguing we are not arguing that the revolutionary minority should be numerically insignificant when the revolutionary process begins, since in any given territory there has to be a critical mass of communists who can take part and influence a wider movement. A class party, however, does not bring this program down from a Mount Olympus or a Mount Sinai. The members of the party are part of the working class and have roots and connections through it without go, which go beyond the actual party membership. At a certain early point in the movement, they assume organizational tasks which help to lead the working class as a whole from existing capitalist organizational structures towards the revolutionary establishment of elected class-wide bodies which begin to replace the bourgeois state. It is within these class-wide bodies that the political debate and struggle for communism has to take place. It is at this point that the movement assumes the character of a majority movement, but it may not yet be a fully communist movement. As Marx explained, once workers are actually engaged in this new social, social and political activity, they begin to experience the world differently. Both for the, for the production on a mass scale of this communist consciousness and for the success of the cause itself, the alteration of human beings on a mass scale is necessary an alteration that can only take place in a practical movement, a revolution. This revolution is necessary, therefore, because the ruling class cannot be overthrown in any other way, but also because the class overthrowing it can only succeed in ridding itself of the muck of ages and become fitted to found society anew. Parliamentarism fragments class consciousness. This is the most important passage for explaining how we can get from a situation of ideological domination by the ruling class to an entirely new view of society. It gives the answers to all those who state that capitalist values are human nature. Our nature changes with our circumstances and our actions, not with the preaching of socialists or communists. This latter error can be found in the tendency of the world socialist movement represented by the Socialist Party, formerly the Socialist Party of Great Britain, in Britain. This organization, organization has existed since the early years of the late century and has a clear Marxist conception of the communist mode of production, correctly criticizing the state capitalist distortions of the statists, which include not only Stalinists and Maoists, but also the Trotskyists. However, they share the same view as the bourgeoisie that the October Revolution was a coup of a tiny minority rather than part of a wider class movement. Instead, they argue that socialism can only come about if workers vote for it via the rules of the bourgeois parliamentary system. As we have demonstrated, this is not only un-Marxist, but is also utopian, and it plays into the hands of capitalist ideologues. 
The Socialist Party has existed for over a century and not achieved one parliamentary seat. This lack of success at the democratic game is grist to the mill of the capitalist class. The record demonstrates that under the conditions of capitalist domination, only a handful of people in capitalist elections will vote for anything other than immediate and capitalist solutions. This should not be surprising since, in the act of voting, workers are isolated from fellow workers and the polling, polling booths, subject to the pressure of immediate daily problems, and only asked to choose between two or three real candidates of various capitalist persuasions. It is no real choice. However, every electoral failure by the Socialist Party or any other electoral formation of the left in any country only gives the capitalist ruling class the lie for use in propaganda that no one wants socialism. It is only under revolutionary conditions that this spell can be broken and a whole new mindset adopted. Instead of passively accepting the will of the bourgeois parliamentary leaders, we now become active participants in the debates of the day. Immediate recall of delegates allows us to directly influence what is debated in the class-wide bodies. However, at this point in any revolutionary movement, the question of communism has only been posed, and perhaps only implicitly at that. Now it needs to be fought for in the debates in the class-wide bodies. And here again, the most active fighters for this new society are by any logic those who are already communist. Only by winning over a majority of the delegates in the main class bodies does the revolution become the movement of the immense majority. The Russian Revolution, a lesson, not a model. The Socialist Party and others have always thrown back at us the undeniable fact that the Russian Revolution failed and that any attempt to use any part of the revolution as an example to be followed will only lead to the same state capitalist tyranny. This issue cannot be brushed aside and we have tried to address it in the in the last few parts of this pamphlet. Let us summarize here. The Russian October Revolution is not a model. The next revolutionary wave will take place in different circumstances and under different conditions than the last one. However, the October Revolution was the only time when the working class anywhere actually overthrew the existing political order. To simply state that, that his was a Bolshevik coup is not only untrue, it also leads a blow, or it also deals a blow to the whole idea that the working class is capable of making revolution succeed. The Bolsheviks themselves resisted any voluntarist taking of power, as can be seen in the July days when they tried to head off an armed demonstration by Kronstadt sailors who wanted to seize power straight away. The Bolsheviks only actively discussed the overthrow of the provisional government once they had a majority in both the main two Soviets and in the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets. The whole world knew that the overthrow, overthrow of the provisional government, which had never been elected, but was simply a committee of the old Tsar's Duma, was going to take place and yet it passed off relatively peacefully because the Bolsheviks had such overwhelming support. Nor did the Bolsheviks think that they could establish socialism in Russia alone, but expressly stated that the October Rev Revolution was the first step in a worldwide socialist revolution. This was not unreasonable, although the Socialist, Party the Socialist Party asserts otherwise. The First World War had created an international wave of unrest which was only equaled in extent by the largely bourgeois revolutions of 1848. By 1917, there had been riots in Italy, strikes in Germany and Britain, and mutinies in the French and British armies. And, in fact, revolution did break out in many European cities within a year of the Russian October. The Bolshevik Revolution inspired these revolts, and for some years after 1917, there was a real threat that the capitalist order would be faced by a greater challenge. The Bolsheviks initially also extended Soviet power throughout Russia after October, and in its early days, the executive committee of the Soviets did act independently of the party on several occasions. These are some of the positive points we take from that experience. However, the failure of the Russian Revolution, which must be seen ultimately as the failure of the World Revolution to usher in a new era of proletarian emancipation has given us a whole new set of experiences upon which we must draw. Whilst the ultimate cause of the adoption of many policies which ran counter to socialism was the civil war and allied intervention in Russia, 
we must also emphasize some lessons from that period. The first is that the proletarian party is not only internationalist in outlook, but internationally centralized in character. If the workers have no country, neither does their party. With the collapse of the Second International, any pretensions that there was an international party before the First World War also vanished. Instead, we were left with a series of national parties. Thus, when the Russian socialists, socialists, Bolsheviks, triumphed on the territory of the Tsarist Empire, then that party became inextricably bound up with the government of that area. To be in a government in an area of brutal international class war foisted on the Russian workers by international imperialism was hardly the best circumstance for developing socialist policies. Indeed, the opposite process took place, as the war demanded a restoration of a standing army. The Red Army absorbed the proletarian militia, the Red Guards. The use of former Tsarist officials in the bureaucracy and, as a response to the terror which the old order waged on the proletariat from the first days of October, the organization of a secret police, the Cheka. If all of the latter had still, if all of the latter had still been directly under the control of the Soviets, this would not have been so serious. But, as we have already mentioned above, the war also tore the revolutionary heart out of the Soviets. By 1920, they were empty shells, as the Kronstadt Rebellion revealed in March 1921. The Bolsheviks, as an isolated organization in a hostile wor world, had no previous working class experience to turn to. Having become the government, they ended up by constructing a state apparatus which was not based on Soviets and which was anti-working class. On the way, despite internal opposition from the likes of the Democratic Centralists, the RCP erroneously decided that the party was the class and thus the dictatorship of the proletariat could be exercised through the party. They tried for a while to keep the party proletarian and communist by occasionally purging it of the careerists and opportunists who entered its ranks for their personal advancement after 1918. It should be noted that this only meant expelling them from the party, not taking any form of punitive action against them. This was the meaning Stalin's massacres later gave to the word, but the consequence of the party became the state, becoming the state was to render such a move futile. Only an international revolution could have reversed this course, as all the Bolsheviks originally accepted. But the adoption of socialism in one country signaled the end of even this faint hope. The Bolsheviks set up a new and communist third international in 1919. Originally, it was planned to be based in Germany, but the failure of the Spartacist revolt in January 1919 meant that Moscow was the only place it could be based. This was another source of weakness for the international working class, since the degeneration of the revolution inside the RSFSR meant the adoption of ever more desperate opportunist policies to try to safeguard the USSR, as the RSFSR became in 1923. In the process, it was transformed into an agent for safeguarding Russian national capital, an arm of the Russian state. The adoption of the United Front with the social democracy was not a brilliant tactic to link the communists to the masses, but a transparent maneuver which only discredited, discredited the international in the eyes of workers. It ultimately strengthened a now openly capitalist social democratic movement. The more the Communist Party became the sole apparatus for running the USSR, the more it ceased to be the vanguard of the international proletariat. It was the Italian communist left headed by Bordiga who, at the sixth enlarged executive committee of the Comintern, openly asked Stalin why the Comintern did not discuss developments inside the USSR. Bordiga was underlining a real problem. The party has to be a world party with a centralized international leadership in advance of the next revolution. It is unlikely that the world revolution will be instantly successful everywhere at the same time. The party's role is not to rule over nor administer any proletarian outpost, but because it is an international body, its entire work is to do with the extension of the revolution. Whilst party members will be in significant, if not dominant positions in any positive move towards communism in the Soviets, they are responsible to the workers who delegate them and they won't accept delegation except for a clear communist mandate. The task of administering any area belongs only to the class-wide organs. 
Party members in any given territory obviously take part in such work, but the leading bodies of the party are international and do not identify with any state or semi-state. The World Party of the Proletariat I lost my purse. The World Party of the Proletariat is an instrument of revolution. It is not equipped to be an instrument of government. This is part of the basic tenets of our organization and has been to s- so since 1943. This was repeated in the 1952 platform of the Internationalist Communist Party. There is no possibility of working class emancipation, nor of the construction of a new social order, if this does not emerge from the class struggle. At no time and for no reason does the proletariat abandon its combative role does not delegate to others its historical mission, and it does not give power away to anyone, not even to its political party. Trotsky's Twists and Turns At such points in speculation about any future proletarian revolutionary process, there enters a whole raft of what-if questions. Many of these are based on the premise that a successful proletarian movement will once again be isolated to a single area. The simple answer to all these is that if a revolution is against, is again isolated, it means that we are in for a further defeat. If the consciousness of the class is not there on a sufficiently wide, i.e. global, scale, it cannot be manufactured. This is one of the cardinal points which identify the left communist tradition. As our comrades in the committee of Intesa in their 1925 platform stated, It is a mistake to think that in every situation, expedience and tactical maneuvers can widen the party base, since relations between the party and the masses depend in large part on the objective situation. The same holds true for the process of revolution. Either the mass of the class is drawn more and more into the process so that the revolution keeps moving towards or forward to deny the imperialists the power base to regroup and destroy us or we will find ourselves isolated to this or that area once again, and the capitalist order will survive once more, whilst plunge, plunging us into further misery and barbarism. All this, is, all this is in stark contrast to the Trotskyist tradition. We have already produced a pamphlet explaining how a highly gifted revolutionary could ultimately bequeath us a tendency which has spawned more and more manip- manipulative organizations which actually take us back to the worst practices of 19th century social democracy. In brief, most of the errors of Trotskyism on class consciousness. And organization are based on the view that if class conscious activity is not there, it can be manufactured on a voluntarist basis by a revolutionary minority. This stems from the degenerating common turn, which one week would be calling the social democrats social fascists whilst the next they would be seeking united fronts with their leaders. Trotsky's own aim to revive a kind of mass movement along the lines of the old social democracy of the Second International led to the entryism of its French section and ultimately most of the Fourth International. By hiding the revolutionary program, the Trotskyists hoped to be part of a wider movement. All they did was to fail in the basic task of defending as openly as possible the communist program, at the same time as giving the impression to the wider world that all revolutionaries are dishonest. Nor can Trotskyists stand back and criticize the Stalinist view that the party, and not the class, is the vehicle of socialist transformation, since they not only shared this view in the 1920s, but even gave rise to some of its most absurd expressions. At one point in their debates, Stalin even lectured Trotsky after the latter had said, no one can be right against the party, that Lenin had always acknowledged that the party would make mistakes. Trotsky's assumption that a mass party could be built in the 1930s led him to reject all the many other small communist organizations which existed in opposition to Stalinism in the 1930s, including our our own political ancestors. He did not accept that, after a defeat of the magnitude of the 1920s, the road to rebuilding a class movement would be a long one, nor that the most important basis for a new proletarian organization was a new program which took into account both the negative and positive lessons of the Russian Revolution. Too much bound up with the creation of the state apparatus of the USSR in the Civil War and early 1920s, this was a task he left to others. 
Today, the same failure to actually defend a communist program is still to be seen in the Trotskyist movement, as the various groupings of this tendency hail every mass movement, however reformist or reactionary, as a model of the United Front. The Communist Left The historical cul-de-sac of the Soviet Union has left us a bitter legacy. It hangs like a millstone around the neck of any revolutionary trying to frame the question of how society and thus humanity is to escape the exploitation and degradation of the capitalist system. There is an understandable but mistaken tendency on the part of those who want to see the emancipation of the working class to throw the revolutionary baby out with the bathwater. The way in which the Bolshevik party first took upon itself the tasks which can only be carried out by the entire class and then became the godfather to a new regime of administrated state capitalism has made even the mere mention of the party a taboo for some. Many assume that those who see that only a minority of workers will become communists before the revolution are repeating the elitist mistakes of the past. This may be understandable given the depth of the defeat suffered after the Russian Revolution, but to deny the fact that the class moving towards revolution will produce a minority organization robs us of one of the tools which are necessary, but not sufficient, can condition for its emancipation. It is time to go beyond the superficial and to recognize that the only vehicle for regrouping and organizing the revolutionary sparks of consciousness produced under capitalist conditions is via some political body, i.e. a world party of the proletariat. There is no other possibility apart from the pious hopes of those who insist that spontaneity can settle everything. History does not offer much comfort of spontaneists. Whilst every revolutionary movement begins with spontaneous acts, these only pose the question of revolutionary transformation. The question is to what does the working class turn once it has embarked on the revolutionary road? In the famous red two years in Italy, the massive spontaneous struggles of the class failed to challenge the state, failed to generate socialist consciousness, and instead, trapped in the ideology of self-management, were led to defeat. Unless there exists a material force which has a revolutionary program based on the lessons of working class experience, the course of any spontaneous movement will always head back towards something safe for capitalism. The party as the body of the most class conscious workers helps to lead and organize the seizure of political power to establish a regime <clears throat> in which class wide organiz organizations can begin the process of revolutionary transformation. The members of the party will be actively involved in this and in positions of leadership, but the party as a body can only remain a class vanguard by remaining outside of any territorial organs and instead acting as the centralized international motor of world revolution. The party is for making world revolution. It is not a state machine, not even in the proletarian semi-state. At the present, Talk of revolution seems to be far distant, although the legacy of the counter-revolution that saved capitalism in the 1920s still dominates working-class conscious. There have been moments when it might have been punctured. At the end of the Second World War, a massive strike wave in northern Italy gave rise to our own comrades' organization, the, Interna the Internationalist Communist Party, which challenged all sides in the imperialist war. Other strikes in Britain and France at this time gave rise to some hope that new independent movements could develop. The PC International became an organization of thousands, with newspapers in many towns across Italy. However, the beginning of the post-war boom and the start of welfare measures in the, in the victor states soon brought this wave of militancy to an end. It was to revive in the period of 1968-74, to 74, when the same post-war boom came to an end and workers responded to the initial attempts of the capitalist class to make them pay for the crisis. For a time, this revitalized revolutionary politics within the working class, but by the end of the 70s, this was also coming to an end. Currently, 2008, the crisis of capitalism has created a new period of rising revolutionary awareness on a global level. However, this is not been on anything like the scale that some revolutionaries have expected. But then consciousness is not a reflex reaction. As we have argued, it involves both material causes and reflection on those material circumstances. 
After more than 40 years of capitalist stagnation, the capitalist class has globally succeeded so far in restructuring the workforce at the heart of the system, whilst at the same time creating island fortresses of high exploitation within the periphery, like the so-called Mechiodoras in Latin America or special economic zones in Asia. Such divisions within the class make it more difficult for it to reconstitute itself as a global revolutionary antagonist to the capitalist system. But the class has been equally divided and consequently written off as a revolutionary class by so-called socialists before. From Bernstein in the 1890s to Cardin, Gortz, and Marcuse in the 1960s, there have been no shortage of grave, dig grave diggers of the working class as the subject of, rev of revolution. But the contradictions of capitalism and the class struggles that engender, or they engender, have always confounded their pessimism by launching new, potentially revolutionary onslaughts. However, for both careerists and opportunists, this wait is too long. They either personally abandon communist work entirely, or they join tendencies in the Trotskyist tradition. As the latter have abandoned the defense of the revolutionary program for spurious short-term numerical gains, they are the equivalent of modern-day Bernsteins, for whom the movement is everything and the goal nothing. As a result, they have brought discredit on the very notion of revolution inside the working class. Only the tradition of the communist left, the tradition to which we adhere, has consistently attempted to come to terms with our past defeats as a class, to provide the long-term programmatic basis for the revolutionary revival of the working class. Currently, the fragmentation of the class is reflected in the dispersal of revolutionary energies. Some have been discouraged by the divisions amongst revolutionaries, but the road back to a revolutionary revival of the working class is a long one. This should not be seen as a negative factor, but as part of the process of the development of class consciousness. Along the way, important debates have been, are, and will doubtlessly continue to be necessary. Without sharp debate to clarify issues, the proletariat will never be in a position to have a solid program on which to fight the next big onslaught on capitalism. At the same time, the tenuous links between revolutionaries and the mass of the class have to be deepened and strengthened. The political organization has to adopt means to maintain its contact with wider layers of workers who may not yet consider themselves revolutionary, but do know that they want to fight capitalism. In the post-war boom, the strategy put forward by the Internationalist Communist Party was that of factory groups, which included members of the party and non-members in several workplaces, including Fiat. However, with the decline of the huge factory concentrations of workers, these are no longer the only way for organizing in the class, as they are not always appropriate. Instead, territorial groups regrouping workers across workplaces or fighting on other issues, e.g. war, housing, and jobs, have been adopted. The key here is that the party must be more deeply rooted in the places where the mass of the class itself is present. The party is not an entity which can be formed at the last minute, and it is not something that only turns up when a struggle takes place. It has to be part of the life of the class. At the present, this is very embryonic, but as the crisis deepens, as more workers come to realize that capitalist solutions to their problems are not solutions for them, then the possibility to work more widely will present itself to revolutionaries. Once workers begin to move, then the practical movement will tend to take on board that program which most meets its real needs. However, this does not mean that revolutionaries wait around with folded arms until the great day. There will be no great day unless those who are already communists fight for that perspective as widely as possible within the class. The World Proletarian Party, or at least a large nucleus of it, has to be in existence in advance of the outbreak of the revolutionary crisis. By its very nature, that party has to be international, as well as internationalist. It is narrow in the sense that its platform and program are based only on the revolutionary lessons of the class struggles so far. Within that framework, all debate is possible, and the party is organized along democratic centralist lines i.e. ultimately all issues are voted on by the members. At the same time, the party will also allow for the existence of factions and tendencies which have the full right of debate and publication of minority opinion 
since there will be no linear road to revolution and there are still many issues which history has not yet answered for us. The health of the organization depends on debate and exchange of opinions. Ultimately, this is also the only healthy way in which the party can develop if it is to act as a centralized force when required to by the situation of the world revolution. Without a shared understanding of the general lines of march, even if there is not, tota not totality of agreement, no meaningful policy will be carried out. Such discussion and debate also prepares each individual party member to act autonomously, to act as a revolutionary should when required by the immediate local situation. There is no mechanism for ensuring this. It lies in the preparation and consciousness of individual members. And this can only come about through a political organization which has an internal life based on education and discussion. Although we have adopted these principles in our statutes, the internationalist communist tendency, as we have re repeated many times, is not the party, since the conditions for it do not yet exist. However, we have raised the banner of the party so that those new forces who do come to a consciousness of the need to overthrow the system have something to rally around. In this process, we also hope to engage with those forces which already exist, to actively cooperate where possible, and ultimately to unite as a real class movement develops. As we wrote in Internationalist Communist 23, the party class relationship is not an academic question. On the contrary, the clarity and fundamental agreement on this fundamental of communist theory and practice is an indispensable precondition for the process of coming together of all revolutionary forces, something which we passionately desire.